Welcome to the lock-in. It's Friday. My name is Barry Chandler with Stories and Sips, and we're here every Friday night toasting one another, raising our Irish whiskey glasses to each other, celebrating our health and uh, the completion of another week. So thank you all for tuning in again on a Friday. Everything is new tonight. New haircut, first time in seven months. New cameras, new lights, new sound, and... Um, New whiskeys being introduced as well tonight. Everything is new. It feels great. Uh, it feels like we're on to the next level of the lock-in, and I'm really excited for the night we have ahead, doing something really new tonight, bringing on an American distillery uh, for very interesting reasons and very Irish uh, reasons as well. So looking forward to talking to uh, the husband and wife team behind Talnua Distillery in Colorado, in Denver and Colorado. You'll see one of the bottles right here. So let me know where you are tonight, where, whether you're out and enjoying yourself and just checking in on the lock-in, whether you're at home. Let me know what's in your glass. Let me know what you're, uh, what you're sipping on. Great to see so many familiar faces here again this evening. Lorkin, uh, thanks for joining. John Dempster, Greg, Jeff Adams, James, good to see you all. Really exciting day today um, in the world of Irish whiskey for me and for our community that we've been building up over the past few months. And uh, actually one year now we've celebrated the anniversary of our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. And today was a big day for us because we launched the registration for our very own whiskey, our collaboration with JJ Curry. And so we have spent the last two to three months planning the release of our whiskey called The Story. And today we uh, launched the registration. The goal was to uh, allow people to register their interest. And many of you who are here right now did just that. In fact, within 90 minutes, virtually 100% of our inventory uh, was accounted for. Uh, almost 200 full bottles, uh, 750 ml bottles were sold, uh, 400 miniature bottles, and many, many custom uh, commemorative tour glasses to commemorate the launch of our very own whiskey. Really, really excited. And thank you so much for the support and the interest in the story. We do have a few bottles left. I think it was just five, maybe four before it came on air. And so we will leave our pre-registration link open in our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. And if you're not in there already, I suggest you pop in. Uh, you can just do a search for Irish Whiskey Fans of America on Facebook and you'll find our group. An amazing outcome for us that in the space of 90 minutes, we were able to account for almost all of the inventory that's going to be leaving Ireland fingers crossed within the next week and finding its way across the Atlantic to New York before being shipped uh, across the country to California. So that a really, really big day for us as an Irish whiskey community. And I'm just so excited that uh, there was such interest and such, um, yeah, such support for, for what we've done. So if, if any of you have registered, uh, pre-registered, the good news is that, um, 99% sure you will have secured yourself a bottle. There's only a handful left. So if anybody does want to register their interest, you can do so in the Facebook group. So thanks to everyone for that. Uh, Kieran is joining us from New Jersey with Talnua Quarter Cask in the Stories and Sips glass. I may have managed to get some Talnua to Kieran. We'll say nothing. We'll say nothing. Um, good to see you, Maureen, from Canada, tuning in. stacy has got some Talnua Old Saints Keep in Ohio. Never has so much whiskey from Colorado found its way around America than in the past two weeks. And it's a great thing because tonight we're going to sip on these uh, wonderful, two wonderful whiskeys from Denver. And we're going to sip them alongside an Irish whiskey, Redbreast 12 year old. So tonight is all about single pot still. It's a discussion that's going to span two continents. It's a discussion, a discussion that spans an ocean, it crosses an ocean, across the Atlantic, and both sides of the Atlantic, single pot still whiskey is being made. And that may be news to many of you, uh, but tonight we're going to explore single pot still whiskey from Ireland and single pot still whiskey from America, specifically from the Middleton Distillery in County Cork on the Irish side and the Talnua Distillery in Denver, Colorado on the American side. So a really interesting night ahead, a great conversation, and really excited to share and to introduce a wonderful couple from Colorado who are doing really interesting, interesting things in the whiskey world. And it really continues our journey to introduce more small, newer distilleries to the audience. And this is a first tonight, though. It's the first time we've ever had an American whiskey or an American distillery featured on the lock-in. And uh, 
we may not do it again because I think after tonight it'll be a very tough bar to, uh, to to reach for anybody else. So tonight is a really special night for us, uh, and looking forward to having the crack with them. Um, with Patrick and Megan in just a couple of minutes. So let me look at your comments before we get in there. That's Dram Good says, great to see the turtleneck. The turtleneck has to make an appearance with a new camera so you can see all its lovely woolen detail in high definition um, screen quality there. So yeah, I, I, I honor you all with the turtleneck tonight. <laughs> Ed is still recovering from this afternoon's excitement, uh, trying to secure a bottle of the story. Ed, uh, you are successful in your efforts. Uh, I'm pretty sure you will be getting your hands on a bottle of that, but good to see you've got some Talnua Old Saints Keep here in your glass as well. Great stuff. So many of you registered for the story. It was tough to keep up. Uh, amazing to see the interest. Shane is drinking eight de Crested 8 Degrees in Mullingar, a new whiskey from the Middleton Distillery, which is the Crested Whiskey, formerly Crested 10, that's been finished in 8 Degrees Stout Casks, 8 Degrees being the brewery that's owned by Perno Ricard and Irish distillers, of course. Mark says the audio and the video is much better. It should be for the amount of money we've dropped now on these lights and these cameras, but it's worth it because we can't just be relying on a webcam. We started off as amateurs. And I want us to become professional whiskey drinkers and streamers here. So hopefully this makes a difference. All right, let me see. What else do I have to tell you about? Okay, so many of you are registered. Thanks, Jeff. Jeff got registered. Can't wait for that. Paul says he's proud. Paul, it's a proud day for the community that we managed to bring this whiskey to market. And of course, I did the least work of all. The real work was done by Louise and Eric and the team at JJ Curry in County Clare in Ireland. They've never moved. They've never brought something from concept to reality so quickly. And right now where it stands is the bottles are all labeled. No, the bottles are not labeled. The bottles are filled and they're waiting for the labels to arrive on Tuesday, but they're due to get on a pallet on Wednesday so they can be shipped across the Atlantic. So there's this very short time frame. We're hoping that the labels arrive. But let me show you a quick video for those of you who are interested in following along with the story and those of you who've registered, you might be interested in this quick update from the JJ Curry farm today. Let me put this up here for you. What you saw there were the first ever miniature bottles to be bottled by JJ Curry on the farm in their blending room in Cora Clare in County Clare in Ireland. 400 bottles, miniature bottles, 50 milliliters bottled by hand by Eric waiting for their label. Uh, all 400 bottles have already been accounted for. But as I mentioned, there's a few full bottles still remaining or if they're, uh, yeah, I would encourage you to register if you're at all interested because some people may drop off before uh, they arrive on American shores. And so we'll keep moving down the list of those who've registered to make sure that everybody has a chance on a first come, first serve basis. So Eric, they're doing a great job hand filling the uh, those bottles and their small little bottling line. All righty. So tonight is, uh, as I mentioned, it's a single pot still extravaganza. And uh, I had the fortune of visiting Denver, Colorado a couple of weeks ago, the one week in the last six months that we've missed our lock in. And for good reason, because we were up in Denver drinking good whiskey. And I think you'll, you'll uh, allow me that brief respite from our lock-ins because I was doing research, of course, and bringing back whiskey that we could talk about. And in my travels uh, it, there in Denver, uh, came across the wonderful Talnua Distillery. So I'm going to bring in the, the lovely uh, Megan and Patrick Miller, the co-founders of the Talnua Distillery in Denver, in Colorado, to join us. The Millers, you're very welcome to the live stream. Thank you. Hello, how are you? We're allowing in American invaders for the first time. I know. And we, I feel, I feel, uh, I feel that by the end of this, we won't feel like we're imposters here. We'll we'll study everyone's uh, mind at ease, and, and we've got the flag behind us to to represent as well. Uh, and first off, I would love to congratulate you on that release. 
Um, we know how big of a deal that is. Um, we also feel the uh, hand bottling and hand labeling. So we understand that <laughs> as well. So Godspeed about getting that done on time, but very excited uh, and humbled to be here tonight. Well, we're delighted to have you, and it's always fun to talk to interesting people doing interesting things, and you're doing, you are interesting people doing very interesting things in Denver and Colorado. Tonight's all about single pot still, and um, I was surprised early on in my Irish whiskey journey to learn that single pot still whiskey could be made outside of the island of Ireland, because there are many stories about how it can only be made in Ireland, and it's Ireland's quintessential spirit, but we're going to dive into that tonight and bust some myths. But I would love to start tonight by getting a better understanding of your background and what led you to this point where you started the distillery in Denver, and uh, help us understand that journey. Yeah, uh, I think so. Um, we're of Irish American heritage. Of course, my name isn't accidentally Patrick, I guess, so let's put it that way. Um, and so we were on our honeymoon in Ireland in 2011. We were actually sitting in a small pub in Galway, um, Unpluckin. And uh, it was a Friday and the United States was playing Ireland. The game was on in New Zealand, so it was about 8 a.m. or so um, in Ireland. We were sitting and watching uh, the game. That's how cool she is, is um, go goes with me and, and has always been a huge rugby fan. So it's a passion we shared together. So on our honeymoon, watching this game, as you can imagine, um, Ireland was handedly beating the U.S. Eagles. Um, and so as the game and our interest in it waned, um, we were talking to the bartender and in walks the first cases of red breast into the pub and the bartender was beside himself, excited about the first single pot still, the first red breast coming back into that pub. And he immediately ripped open the boxes and, and was sharing that with us. And then began, uh, we're, we were so lucky that he really knew the story and, and the history of pot still whiskey. And red breast is such an easy whiskey to fall in love with. And when you're on your honeymoon, watching rugby, sipping the first single pot still back into the market, uh, which was 2011, uh, which still blows my mind that it was less than a decade ago that Redbreast had, had made this landfall again back on the island. And we were one of the first people to partake of, of that. And truly it sparked a love affair of wanting to get our hands on Green Spot as it came out, all the powers expressions of John's Lane and Three Swallows, um, Barry Crockett legacy uh, and being something that we just, as they were available to us, really began to give us the taste for this whiskey and this style. And it soon became just our absolute favorite. And it, it was to the point where going through US customs every year, going back to Ireland was troublesome because we had cases of booze coming back. Uh, and you know we had to convince US Border Patrol that we were gonna drink all of this. This wasn't to be resold. Uh, we might share with friends and family, but we had to buy a 12 month supply for ourselves uh, um, to share. And that was the spark, right? As these came out and it got bigger and bigger. And then as new distilleries started to come out like Teeling and Glendalock and, and, uh, and Kilbegan making their re-entry, the love affair just grew, right? I mean, we were already fans when it was Redbreast 12 uh, out of Middleton. And that was basically kind of the only bit that you could access. Um, right. And you know, we were both in oil and gas. I was a chemist, Megan was an environmental scientist. Um, and so we, uh, in 2014, there was a, a significant downturn, right? Kind of the last downturn before the, the COVID scenario hit oil and gas as well here recently, um, that my company decided to strategically close all of their um, regional offices and bring everybody back to the headquarters, which was in, in um, Texas, uh, in the Woodlands, Texas, outside of Houston. And we love Colorado. Um, we wanted to live here and Megan had a fantastic job. So it was like, well, one of us is gonna be looking for a job. You know, what do we wanna do? And also we've had this burning passion now 
to create something and, and to be a husband and wife team, quite frankly. Uh, and that spark of loving the chemistry and, and being in home brewing and, and having this opportunity that kind of hit us, right? I am not, uh, it's funny because I'm not that story in craft spirits or whiskey uh, or brewing that's like, I hated my job as an attorney, so I quit and started making beer. I actually quite loved my job and I loved the team that I was on. Um, and we were just in a unique scenario that forced us to make a decision. Um, and so I took a class up at Breckenridge Distillery. They used to run classes up there about how to start a distillery. Um, and so I took that class and I know, and, and you know this as well, there's many romantic parts of making whiskey there are you're a you're a, a stainless and copper janitor is really what you are and you babysit yeast and so the the glory factors of running the still and and moving casks around that's a that's a small part of the grander scheme of of what yeah. whiskey making is and getting that from grain to glass and so i then applied for a job at stranahan's uh, which is colorado's biggest distillery um, currently owned by proximo spirits as well um, those guys uh let me in shockingly and i was able to start making whiskey and it was all it's a single malt so all malted barley whiskey and so I really got familiar with the production at scale of making whiskey at Stranahan's while I was making whiskey at the house. Megan and I would fire up the still. We did, we probably had 35 to 40 weekends a year that we were making whiskey um, uh, at, at the house, totally legally. Um, well, let me ask and, you this. If, if, yeah. So you're, make, you're making it legally in the house um, you know, oftentimes in, in, in relationships, one person is more interested in doing a thing than the other. And the other sometimes is, is dragged kicking and screaming because out of love, or perhaps they'll acquiesce. Megan, was this a, a, a equally interesting concept to you or was it more driven by the love of a husband? No, definitely. The concept itself was, it's actually my idea that he'd go to the distillery school. I should have, I should have mentioned that. Yeah, <laughs> you should have. Um, you know, it was kind of one of those things like, let me live vicariously through you and just like push you to do something that would be totally cool. Mm -hmm. um, one of us on, had to have a real job. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so I paid the bills, uh, but doing it on the weekends, however, was not as appealing to me. So we were thankful to have a few friends that really helped us on the weekends get through those long days it was, it was actually quite nice because she would kind of set up almost a hospital we would have effectively a little house party there's a lot of hurry up and wait with distilling as well right, uh, right. and brewing anybody knows at home brewing it's easy to flip on the football game and kind of let the mash cook or let the, the still heat up and dribble off slowly so so there's definitely kind of a uh it, it was it made yeah. for a lot of fun weekends but uh it, it's work i mean we were doing it to put in the work but distilling isn't legal in many states at home, is it? Is that something that's particularly uh, unique to Colorado? No, I lied to you, Barry. Um, <laughs> it is 100% illegal in the state of Colorado. You know uh, we're recording this, right? It, it's everywhere in the United States. Uh, however, we, we definitely used, uh, uh, we used the excuse, really, it's, it's if you're selling it. And you're and you're using it for income or bartering. That's really where stuff gets into big trouble. Um, right. Now we pay so much in taxes. I think it's worth the few years and few gallons that were able to be made at the house. Uh, the federal government will. Well, not, they were never not, caught. Really That's the main thing. Yeah, they never yeah. caught you in the act. And maybe the That's statute right. of limitations has run out on that by now. So <laughs> you you should be okay. And I and I said one of the crazy things is technically, if you go by the book, hundred percent. You have to build out your entire distillery before you ever practice that, the craft at all, or do any recipe development. So on the legal side, you would have to invest all of the money up front, build out a distillery, and do your first trials on equipment in a fully functional distillery. And so uh, I think they they know. Yeah. <laughs> they the, know. The, the liquor industry, of course, notoriously controlled, difficult to do anything I often say that back in the uh, 
Back in the turn of the century, the, the crooks wore masks, but now they wear suits, you know, and they're able to, <laughs> yeah, to, to impose uh, their ways upon. But it's a it's a really tough industry to get into. But you you pushed through anyway and decided it was worth going from home distilling into something a bit bigger because unless you're there sitting in your living room, if I'm not mistaken, you're sitting in a distillery now. <laughs> I that that is uh, though I would love my living room to. I have this facade as well. Um, uh, yeah, this is our, our our large cask aging. We also have quarter casks, um, of course, and we'll get into uh, with uh, with our quarter cask tasting as well. Uh, but right behind me here are our uh, sherry casks, um, some that we have stacked up for future releases. So a little teaser okay. there. Uh, of course, that's three years from now. But uh, again, it's uh, it, many things on the horizon sitting sitting behind me. Um, but okay, yeah, so I mean, we, we're, as we we're going to talk, I want to we're going to get to these whiskeys. So Talnua, we got two whiskeys from from Talnua tonight. But before we get to those, um, Steve has correctly pointed out that my glass looks. I look thirsty, and my glass looks empty. I don't want to pour this until I get the proper tour. <laughs> so so I'm going to pour Redbreast, and and hopefully I don't insult you with this. But I know that there is a you know you you shared the Redbreast story, so I feel like you'll approve of the red breast 12 year old oh I there mean, we go look at that i mean we absolutely we have some here as well um i mean that i, I we also really appreciate that you uh pitted a 200 year old distillery and a 12 year old whiskey up against uh, a two-year-old distillery and a two-year-old whiskey but... <laughs> david and goliath you know you, you know the story of david and goliath you know who wins. it is absolutely <laughs> Uh, but no, I mean, it's it, it was it was what sparked this. I mean, uh, to be completely honest, uh, that that was the anthology of Tolnua was born of a taste of red breast in, in a pub in 2011 sitting in Ireland. And the, and the story transcended from there, bridged an ocean and and it landed in the in the middle of the continent. Uh, and, you know, I mean, that's one thing that that we, in, in 2014, when, when we really started making this at the house and I was at Stranahan's and everybody thought I was nuts because we would distill all week and then go home and distill on the weekends. And we were trying to develop this recipe. Um, it, it never lost us steam. Redbreast kind of kept it. It was like, we know this is possible. We know that the dream of this is is possible. And, and it, it really kind of carried us um, mashing in and we'll talk about the the mash bills and yeah. how this plays in mashing unmalted barley is very difficult um and so our first five plus batches were really garbage um very green tasting grassy yeah, yeah. tasting um uh, a lot of fusel oils so that those kind of uh flavor profiles that you get that have a dark musty bitterness to them right um that when played nicely those bitter kind of notes can add to the flavor profile but when they're an overriding element to the whiskey it uh we we had some challenges uh, early to well, well let me let me take you back to i want to go back to there's a period there between distilling at home and then knowing that you've got awful garbage flavors coming out of your first batches like a lot had to happen between um home and there but you can't be telling me the story unless there's something in your glass. Tell me you're sipping on something. Have you red breast poured? Have you something? I've got red breast in my glass. And I, a little, I'd like to give a little toast, a little welcome to you both to the show. And uh, I'm thirsty, you know. I'm thirsty <laughs> so, as well. So, Slauncha, and thank you for joining us. Uh, really delighted to have you. And, and uh, I know we've got uh, some fun discussions ahead, but thank you for, for your time this yeah. evening. Hmm. So we can't we talk about prepared. single pot still and not have it in our bellies, you know. That's right. Yeah, we came prepared. We've got a bit of all of them in front of us here. So <laughs> nice. Okay, yeah. that's good. Yeah. <laughs> we're sipping them. I'm already doing. I'm already developing the notes here that we're going to talk about the uh, the nuances between the whiskeys. Okay, good. I, I and I'm looking forward to hearing the distiller's perspective on this. Um, mm -hmm. how hard was it to go from? Wouldn't it be nice to do something like this? To we have a, a, a functioning distillery. Help us understand that journey to that. I think um, you have to have a healthy level of naivete. Um, the things that you don't know, uh, for, don't build mindset barriers to starting a distillery because it is incredibly difficult um, to both create a recipe that you believe that people will love and enjoy and 
you are very public about it. There's no hiding it. Like this is this is out into the world as soon as you release it, and people tell you what they think. Um, and that's that's a that's a good thing that you get real feedback. It's not mom and dad and friends and family kind of telling you, you know, oh, this is this is good. Yeah, you're totally doing great. Uh, we really like this. Um, we actually had an opportunity while I was at Stranahan's, uh, a distillery closed in the location that we're currently in. And that allowed us to get in with a, a smaller barrier of entry um, because there were some elements here. One of them was the pot still that we actually procured and were able to take over. Um, we had some things that it's, it's kind of that right place, right time scenario uh, and the generosity of Robert Segrist, one of our business partners that got us into this space, into the distillery that you visited. Um, he owns the building. And so he took a chance, even after a distillery had gone out of business here, he took a chance on us and took a chance on our idea. And we had just met him. He actually walked into Stranahan's and we had a cocktail together and he was like, well, turns out I've got this distillery that has just recently gone out of business. He, I don't know how to use any of this, but I know what it is. And I was like, I do know how to use all of that. Let me give you a call right after I'm off shift here um, and left Stranahan's and we sat down, he showed us the space. Um, we sat down with stuff we had made at the house. He was like, I love this. How do we do this? And I said, I have no idea. Uh, and so we were then joined by Amy, our creative director, my cousin, who had actually been working with us as we were doing distilling at the house. We were also building the brand and the identity. Who do, who do we want to be? Who do we want to represent? There's so many things that you think of when you think of building a brand. It's not just the whiskey. It's the label, the name, um, how we interact with people, how we're able to draw in um, the same love affair with single pot still and how we get people to fall back in love with a whiskey that they never knew was a huge deal. Uh, and we'll talk about the history here as well. Yeah, I think yeah. just because I think it's such an important thing as, you know, why are we really the only ones dedicating a full distillery to nothing but single pot still whiskey? Um, were, were you both whiskey fans before going to Ireland you were so you you were you bourbon fans is that what no. you were drinking no nope. uh, single malts we did, a lot of, we did a lot of single malts i think in the beginning um uh i really loved uh balvany caribbean cask um and also glen Morangi, like for your for bang for your buck mm -hmm. gotta love it right <laughs> and yeah. and now i mean that was i think i think it it also flows through this we've always been barley whiskey people um we're hardly whiskey monogamous, and there are bourbons out there, of course, we love. But but really, the the um, you know again in 2015 we were in Scotland for the Rugby World Cup again enters into our story, and and we did a full tour of Scottish distilleries that that year as well, um, just because there's so much to see up there, um, and we were fully ingrained at this point of speaking of that look and feel. How do we want this to be? How do we want this distillery to, to look? Of course, we're in a right. small warehouse in Arvada, Colorado, um, but dreams are built big, brick by brick, Barry. So someday, this is phase one. You're actually joining us tonight on a, on a phase one scenario um, where we are in the process of ripping out all of our existing equipment and building out all new pot stills, all new fermentation, processing tanks. So. Very excited. So maybe about we'll that. give maybe we'll give a little tour in a minute. We might twist the camera around in a minute uh, when we get to that point to show people. And we've got some images to show people so they understand sure, yeah. what we're yeah. talking about here and kind of place it. Um, the name Talnua then. So as part of your research and your determining your position, your brand, who you want to be, and your vision, where did the name Talnua come from, and, and what does it mean? Absolutely, uh, it came from the Irish for new land or new world really wanting to tie our identity uh, to the United States with this Irish American heritage that, that we carry, that this connection that's been part of our lives for so long. Um, you know, we're part of the Irish network here, a business community. Um, the distillery then sponsors the Denver Gales, which is uh, hurling and Gaelic football. 
club here locally to Denver. Um, I was in Denver and district pipe and drum as well. I'm a drummer. So the, the Celtic community and the heritage was something that we wanted to celebrate. And adding whiskey to that really meant something and, and yeah. identifies us as Irish Americans as well. I, of course you have the culture in Ireland and then all of us who have come over and generations later have created a, a unique scenario, a wild scenario um, that spans states and uh, it has been a cultural heritage, something that, especially if you uh, understand America as a salad bowl, right? Uh, instead of a melting pot is that we all exist here, but groups have strong identities still. And it's important to, to share those and to bring those to other people. Uh, and it's always been a fun thing to share that heritage here in the United States and, and right really name. bridge this over. And so Talnua, meaning new world, firmly placed us here uh, in, um, in America with that Irish heritage. So, so far, so good. You like whiskey, you like red breast, <laughs> you distilled at home, you found a business partner, you found a building, you got a name. Was there then the, the, the question of, well, how are we going to make this thing? It's been made typically in Ireland for hundreds of years. It's not being made in the United States. There's no real history of single pot still production in the United States, is there? Or no, not at all. Not, not any that we could find whatsoever. Um, Following the Irish technical file. Okay. Right. Right, so there, there okay. are some who have created, uh, they're more one-offs or a product in a multitude of lines um, where for us, we dedicate singly and we follow that Irish whiskey technical file. So, so one thing that we do, um, one, you touched on something that it wasn't being made here and in Denver, Colorado, you couldn't get Redbreast unless you were really out to get it until 2015 and uh, kind of the fall of 2015. So we're talking less than five years ago or right at five years ago was when Redbreast was even available. So there were just whiskeys that we couldn't get here that we wanted. So some of it was like, well, why don't we make it right? Um, the second thing is, is getting this kind of history um, understood both of how it happened in Ireland, the rise and fall of pot still whiskey, and now the rise again, uh, we hope to be a part of. That translation uh, over to where we are uh, also is drawn by the grains that are native to Colorado. So we are here in barley country, thanks predominantly to the Coors family, we grow a lion's share of the barley in the United States. And so, we realize too that there's no governance in the United States for this style of whiskey because nobody makes it. And so we then self-govern by the Irish whiskey technical file. So we follow all the rules of uh, the malted and unmalted barley percentage. We're 50-50. If you know single pot still, you must be a minimum of 30% malted barley, a minimum of 30% unmalted barley. You can play around with that ratio um, to meet that 100% total uh, with the five grain exception on top of, uh, of the addition of 5% uh, of grain addition into the mash bill. Uh, we wort separate fermentation, so just to still the beer or wash, which is another important element because an American tradition of distilling whiskey is a grain on tradition, um, which I'll touch on in a second. And then distilled in copper pot stills, um, unobstructed pot stills. So uh, our still is um, really an old, almost akin to a moonshine shaped pot still um, that kind of the American heritage, but of course the Irish taught America how to distill. It was the Irish coming over um, that had oftentimes little money, um, but the know-how of how to distill, especially before you really had a meaningful cash economy, especially in the West and Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, uh, booze bartered well and it, and it stayed well, right? Your grains yeah. were able to be used for, for making this uh, for making whiskey and then being able to, to trade with that. And there's a whole Irish American story there. Likely if barley grew and barley was the predominant grain in New England, which is Maryland, uh, it's Maryland rye territory, 
especially in Maryland, um, and in um, Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, that's corn country. Uh, barley really doesn't grow on the Eastern seaboard. Now, now you can grow any, you yes. can grow limes in Colorado. Um, but at the time, local wasn't just the cool option, it was the only option. And so those grains, um, if, if we were talking about barley on the Eastern seaboard, um, they would have been making that because that's that's the whiskey that they were making at home in Ireland is is predominantly barley based. Right. Um, top still. Well, it's a it's a lovely um, romantic look back at history when you think that the grains originally might have been used for for bread for food that would have spoiled fairly quickly, and then the next way to preserve that a little bit longer was perhaps to make beer, and then yeah. the beer would run out, and then distilling suddenly took took that beer and turned it into something that could last a lot longer, and so that grain went from harvest all the way to sowing uh, the next season again, and gave you that length to the grain that, that wasn't there before. And it's and it's a huge part of that American tradition. I mean, even going back to um, the Whiskey Rebellion, I believe it is 1794. You'll have to fact check me on that uh, on that date. Um, but but predominantly Irish Americans in Pennsylvania stood against George Washington when they started taxing their whiskey. It was like you're happy to put us on the front lines again against the British, but now you're taxing our way of life. Uh, and and there's a, a whole lot to uncover there. Um, just the Whiskey Rebellion is a is a great Google. Um, tons of history there, uh, but it really permeated the American landscape, and it was driven by Irish, Scotch Irish uh, distilling know-how and and German um, farming practices that had taken hold in in those areas as well. Um, so it really became that kind of melting pot um, style bourbon was born of the Irish distilling tradition. Right, Megan, when it, when it came to the naming of this this idea to distill something that was akin to the red breast that you'd fall in love with the green spots this style of whiskey um you said you, you were working off the technical file the irish technical file which is the legal document that is enshrined in irish and european law that governs what irish whiskey is what did uh, how did the american side of things from a legislative um description standpoint stack up or in what way were you aligned or not aligned with what you would then call your whiskey? Sure. I think, um, you know, with our, our heritage selection, which we don't have here tonight, um, is our blend, uh, kind of like a Jameson or a Tullamore Dew. Um, it was a doozy for the TTB. We it spent probably six months talking back and forth with them on um, what they needed to see where, while, you know, part of the struggles that we've had were that, we just want to be honest with what's in the bottle from our labels. Um, and a lot of times, you know, you can't say blended whiskey because that has certain category requirements in America that, you know, when we actually have a blend that should in your mind be a blend, we can't call it a blended whiskey. Um, so it's been complicated. Um, but, you know, I mean, I think we've found some good partners in the TTB that uh, have kind of recognize that we are trying to create a category here um, and and they're trying to work with us as much as they can. So the, the phrase single pot still doesn't exist in the American whiskey world, does it? No. Right. And, and I think the one thing that, and something that Megan and I really read through all this documentation, which is just an arduous task. Uh, there, there's a lot to uncover both on the American and, and on the Irish side. Um, the important thing that we found in that document and in the subsequent EU documents is that the protected term is Irish whiskey of any kind, yeah. whether it be Irish grain whiskey, Irish sing single malt or single pot still whiskey, um, that it wasn't single pot still that was protected. It was uh, just like single malt uh, where uh, there is an American um, group that is working hand in hand with the TTB, hopefully by 2021 to have an American single malt category that's governed and has certain rules and regulations surrounding that. So when, when we were looking through all the documents, it says you can't make Irish single pot still, but we took the mindset that just like you can't make Irish single malts in the United States, you can't make an 
Irish single pot still in the United States, but we can make an American single malt and an American single pot still. And and okay. we and we took that honestly. Maybe we convinced ourselves of it because we wanted it so bad. Um, but but we convinced ourselves that that was that that wasn't going to get us into any legal trouble. Um, and and so far, you know, working with the TTB, they are also they don't want to. Uh, do anything to cause any kind of issues with Irish whiskey and the right. EU because they have interest in protecting bourbon, of course, and and things that products that come out of the United States. And so they really go tit for tat on that. They want to make sure that um, when they're, they're they're doing their due diligence to protect um, interests globally so that they have the kind of reciprocation yeah. of governance well, there. So it, what what category does the your single pot still technically fall under in American whiskey? whiskey. Just whiskey. Okay. Whiskey. And what are the what are the requirements legally to be called whiskey in America? Now you're putting me on the spot. Cha chapter <laughs> four, Do we know? Megan, just yeah. recite chapter four of the TTB manual. Um, I, I Have you not memorized every page? Yeah. <laughs> at one point when we read them um, and did the labels, I knew that off the top of my head, but I do not right now. Okay. <laughs> it's things like it must be distilled out of grain. Um, yep. So it can't be dis distilled out of sugar, of course, which would be rum. Um, so it must be distilled out of grain, must be distilled to under 160 proof, uh, must be barreled at between 100 proof and 125 proof, and must be bottled at no lower than 80 proof. Uh, those are the big swing patterns. And then okay. you have subsects of that, of course, bourbon, which would make 51% uh, corn an additional rule. It would make virgin oak barrels, American white oak barrels an additional rule. Um, straight American whiskey makes two-year-old whiskey with virgin American oak, um, but it can be any type of grain. So you could have a straight rye whiskey. We technically yes. could on this bottle, on this batch, though it says 18 months on the label, it's all over two years old for this batch that's currently in your hand. Um, and so that would technically meet the straight American single pot still designation. Uh, all for, virgin American white oak. Yeah, go ahead. I see. Mm -hmm. For for a whiskey then, it can just be aged for a day, can't it, to be called whiskey? Or does it need, it, like, or even a minute, five minutes gives it, five minutes and once it touches the wood, it's whiskey, right? It's, it's once it touches the wood, uh, you have to put an age statement on it, but the minimum age statement um, has to be applicable to the style. So, I mean, we have friends uh, at, a, at a local distillery here that make a white whiskey and it says touched to oak for no less than one minute. Um, <laughs> and, and that allows you to put uh, whiskey on the bottle instead of putting moonshine on the bottle. Of course, what is oak doing in less than a minute? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not sure how cheeky. I feel about that. Yeah, <laughs> right, it's I'm kind of a sure. cheeky. It's a bit cheeky, but uh, I don't think it, we'll be it, having them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, uh, those, those kind of things, you know, uh, get get into regulatory things. I mean, yeah. I can't tell you how thankful we are uh, to not have that three year old designation. Um, was really interested in Peter Mulryan's last article about um i think you can go on to uh blackwater distillery's website and i and they That's have right. a blog of of the uh, uh the kind of anthology of of mindset around that distillery's development of different whiskey styles there um yeah. but they have a, a three-year-old statement document that right. that was really good uh, yeah and for those but, of you who are who are just joining us um i'm here with patrick and megan miller founders of Talnua Distillery in Arvada, Colorado, and they are here to share their single pot still whiskey with us. And we're talking about single pot still whiskey. Many of you will be familiar with single pot still from Ireland and maybe think that's the only place that single pot still whiskey can come from. There aren't many places in the world making it, but they are making it in Colorado. Irish single pot still is a different beast to what's being made in the, in the United States. And the Middleton Distillery in County Cork would have had a lock on single pot still for the last 50 years, I would argue. Certainly from 1973 to 2012, they were the only ones in the, probably in the world making single pot still whiskey until Dingle came along and started making their single pot still whiskey. Yeah. But now we have more distilleries around the world who are, uh, who are 
replicating or being inspired or being, uh, yeah, inspired to to create something as fantastic as Irish single pots of whiskey. I'd love if you could tell me then the story of this is your 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 standard bearer. This Talnua quarter cask is your mainstay, right, of your brand. Um, help us understand what is this whiskey. What should we know about it from an age ingredient perspective? Yes, absolutely. So the the first thing, and we kind of we've touched on this already, uh, is is since Irish whiskey makers have rules and regulations surrounding this style of whiskey being made. We want it to self-police or self-govern by that same whiskey file. The only thing that we don't do is the age statement of three years, because that is something that, um, uh, well, we'll talk about, I'll talk about with the aging and how that really affects things, um, but it's an arbitrary number. Uh, whiskey doesn't magically become whiskey at at three years, um, arguably, many whiskeys get better and better. So whiskey that's a year old versus whiskey that's three years old might have more palatable characteristics um, to it, but it's definitely not something that defines how whiskey must taste. So uh, our single pot still is 50% malted barley, 50% unmalted raw barley. Uh, it is then uh, fermented, with just the wort portion, so we make a beer or a wash, we then triple distill that wash, and that wash then becomes our single pot still distillate. Uh, that distillate is then cut down with El Dorado Springs water, which is a local nat natural springs from here. Um, they are two or three time world water champions, which that's a thing. Um, there world is water a, champion. Uh, I love it. maybe the most boring competition of all times, but there <laughs> is a uh, something they're very proud of. Uh, and, and only about 30, 45 minutes drive from here is the natural spring. Um, so we have water brought to the distillery. We cut down into barrels, um, that are virgin American white oak. So something that is very rarely done in Ireland is adding that virgin American white oak. And that's really something that is um, part of the culinary heritage of the United States whiskey makers. Um, that quarter cask uh, is also a smaller cask, a 30 gallon cask that, um, or 25 gallon cask, excuse me, that changes the surface area ratio to the liquid contact proportion that you would get um, um, from a 53 or a wine cask at 59 to 70-ish gallons. Um, uh, as you change casks, the interaction and oxidation of whiskey changes. Uh, and one thing that happens here is the reason I keep drinking water uh, is because we're at 6,000 feet here. And so um, uh, a significant bit of altitude just outside of the mile high city, right? Um, and that changes the, first of all, our weather can be nuts. Uh, it'll be every bit of 95 here in the summer and it can drop below zero degrees Fahrenheit here in the winter. So we have wild temperature swings. Um, Actually, Barry, I think that you were here the week that we had that snowstorm, right? Yeah, it was 95 it was 90, degrees. 95, on a, 95 then, on a Monday, 30 on a Tuesday. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. yeah th uh, thanks for that. It was supposed to be my vacation, you know? I know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're, we're good at ruining people's uh, vacations here. That's a, uh, But it definitely is something that changes the aging profile. Uh, you know, we talk about we're closer to the angels here, so they take a higher share. So our angel share or evaporation rate is much higher where Ireland touts a 2% evaporation rate. We have upwards of 7% evaporation rate a year, right? In those That's quarter casts, you also get higher evaporation. Uh, the quarter cast shape and size allow for a higher evaporation rate. However, it also allows for a higher oxygen and nitrogen exchange ratio that changes those tannin and lignin compounds bound in the oak itself into esters of caramels and vanillas. Um, uh, we get an interesting kind of 
subtle banana, maybe a banana's fosters note that floats through um, our pot still whiskey at its at its age. Um, all of those whiskey ketones are notes that are derived from the angel share in a barrel. That's the beauty of yes. aging whiskey. Otherwise, you would just throw it into a stainless steel tote and throw oak chips in it. And then uh, you would have yeah. whiskey just by the addition of oak. Uh, it's the time and the angel share evaporation that gives you that exchange. You know, you know the way you go to the supermarket now and you, you're shopping for toilet paper and it says six rolls equals 12 or mm -hmm. four rolls equals 16. It's the most confusing thing ever. And as I'm listening to you t t talking about the quarter casks, it's a bit like that or human and dog ears. You know, it's your quarter cask, one year and a quarter cask is equal to maybe more years in full cask, right? Is that is that yeah. the argument? That that is the argument. I'm also going to steal that. I feel like that's a very good COVID argument because people <laughs> speak toilet paper. Uh, you can have that. That's, that's free. No charge for <laughs> that. Yeah, I yeah. appreciate that. I'll I'll quote you if I think about it. Um, Please. But but that is a uh, is something um, actually. I think a gentleman on tonight, um, Steve Smathers and Jeff uh, Adams were actually here visiting as well. And we were talking about, you know, Steve asked me, how many years is it? Like, what is the, what is the year translation there? And it's something that's really difficult to answer I, um, because the notes are significantly different. I mean, especially when we're talking about contrast to red breast second fill barrels um, sitting for more than a decade uh, where you have virgin American white oak that's going to give you a much different flavor profile there. Um, and then translating that into years old uh, is tough. I am very happy to say that most of the feedback that we've gotten publicly where we aren't there to sway people's hearts and minds, as it were, um, are very surprised that it's between 18 months, especially in that first batch, and now and now just over 24 months. Um, yes. People have made the assumption that it's in the four year old range. So, uh, you know, maybe you say add a year to to two years for every yep. year that you put into that that quarter cast. So I've, I've poured a drop here. I'm letting it breathe a little bit um, and I'm nosing it. But before we talk a little bit about those notes and, and, and the liquid itself, a few questions that are coming in that um, you might be able to answer. Ed yeah. Powers asks, how does the evaporation rate affect the proof? So is it the water that's evaporating? Is it the alcohol? How does that um, play out? Yeah, we are actually, it's great, great, great question, Ed. Ed's the king of questions. I actually answered an email from him question. recently about, uh, <laughs> a, about a bunch of different aging profile questions and how that happens. It's a really great question. We actually go up in proof. So we're losing water preferentially. Uh, of course, the overall volume is higher. Um, but in Ireland, it is the general rule that water content is higher than the alcohol content that you put in. We're flipped in Colorado, um, where the alcohol content is higher, but we've lost a lot more overall. So even though the proof is going up, we're not gaining alcohol so much as okay. preferentially losing water. Um, and it's a it's a great. There's a chart. I cannot remember the name of it. It's a barometric pressure uh, and humidity ratio chart that actually is a giant U. Uh, that shows where different climate zones fit on um, alcohol versus mm. uh, water gotcha. evaporation ratio. Um, and of course, Ireland and Scotland with high humidity and high barometric pressure, um, they're losing alcohol preferentially. Um, where here, a much lower barometric pressure uh, and very low humidity. I think our humidity back here right now is, is up 12% on our, uh, maybe even less than that. Um, so, okay. so we're very low in humidity back here. Um, it just, so. it, it does show the, how these, these factors are so important and so relevant to the eventual product that ends up in the bottle that we might not always consider the air, the, 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 the altitude, sure. the level of oxygen, the, the, yeah, these things matter to the, to the whiskey. And, and, you know, we constantly, we talk about this, especially when we're, you know, our biggest, one of our biggest, um, and thank God for Redbreast uh, for this statement as well. 
uh, our biggest education point is just telling people what single pot still is. Why is it different? What makes it unique? Um, that uh, without red breast would be even harder because also red breast in, in an amazing way gives us an amazing whiskey to point to people where I've only ever heard maybe two people in the, uh, in the nine to 10 years say, nah, I don't really like it. Right. Um, I, I think that it, it gives us something to, to direct yeah. people that they understand. Uh, and so when, when we're discussing this with people who come into the distillery, we draw the line between what California wine growers did by taking French grape varietals and sticking them in American soil in California and, mm -hmm. and then bringing that, that maybe buzzword terroir to uh, this style of whiskey. And that's really what we are doing. I mean, I, I, I love watching stuff come out of Waterford because of how much they're showing people Regional varieties, even with it, there you are, there you are, there you are. Uh, even within, I was ready, and and having uh, farms produce barley that then they translate into whiskey that palatably tastes different. And so right. we're doing the same thing. Car Colorado grown barley, uh, El Dorado Springs water, of course, then virgin American white oak, something that's very American, and then aging that here in Colorado uh, in a climate that might as well be as different as possible from Ireland is bringing in our terroir to this style of whiskey and really being proud of, of what that brings to the spirit style. The, the, there's a, a danger sometimes in comparisons that people have expectations that if if you use red breast as a, a barometer or as a, a destination or, or maybe a, a mile marker of, of quality, perhaps that that you'd be measured against and people might say, well, it's no red breast. But that's not really the point, as you're as I'm hearing from you. It's no what we have here is a red breast is a style from Ireland or is, a, is an expression using, the, you know, of the same style of whiskey that we're making, but completely different environmental conditions ingredient yeah. all the the terroir is a great way to look at it the terroir is different so the whiskey is going to be different mm -hmm. let's taste it let's get this in our glass i have it here let's do it. I, I i'm sure you've tasted it before but uh it's only my second tasting so i had a I had a tasting flight in your tasting room let me put up a picture here of your tasting room and i'm going to get you to swing around the camera in a few minutes to show people the distillery but sure first I'll try let to, me I'll uh, try not to make people motion sick Okay, so here's the tasting room. Over there in the far left corner is where I sat for my little <laughs> tasting. I'm not sure if we can see it on the screen. I don't think you have it there. But when I sat there, there was a, a, a green bottle on the shelf with no label on it. And it was unmistakably a red breast bottle. And I knew immediately, aha, they're red breast fans. We can talk to these people. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, we've got some people in our tasting room watching right now. So hello. Oh yeah, Hello, we're live streaming room. into the tasting room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I in the tasting room. Order lots of great cocktails. This uh, yeah. whiskey goes great in cocktails. Um, okay, so this is a very different whiskey than what we would be used to as a single pot still in Ireland. Uh, talk us through, uh, lead us through a little bit of a mini tasting, if you wouldn't mind, Megan and Patrick. Absolutely, and I'll, I'll let Megan. She always gets some notes as well uh, uh, that that she's fond of in this whiskey. Uh, one thing is and that I found is giving this three to five minutes to just sit and and come into its own a little bit. One thing with, with younger whiskeys um, uh, that you always notice, and I do this with anything kind of under four years of maybe a bottled in bond, um, is give it just a few minutes to lose the sharper ethanol notes that might be inherent to a whiskey um, uh, that's under 12 years, say. Um, once that disappears and kind of is is eliminated just through that natural evaporation, that nice American oak note really rises right up to the forefront. That caramel note that it's so famous for and why it's so coveted worldwide, um, you really get to that, that note pronounced right away then i so always virgin american oak. that virgin, virgin american, american oak yep 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 exactly then coming behind that i always get kind of an almondy nutty note 
to that as well. Um, like sliced almonds, um, there's a bit of sweetness to the smell of, of it, uh, followed by, like I said, by that almost bananas foster note. Yeah. If you're going to get bananas a kind of a strong. fruity note, yeah. um, I always get that kind of in that, in that order and it dances around. And really the more you know it, I found with this, and I, and I have found this with Redbreast as well, is one of those co-comparisons, is it changes in your glass. Uh, especially with every sip and as you enjoy it, um, it is the opposite of a linear flavor profile where many malt whiskeys or bourbon whiskeys can have a very expected taste where it tastes like sip one and sip 20. Um, our pot still whiskeys, and I think a hallmark of pot still whiskey, is the, is the way that it compounds and builds on the palate, both the nose and then especially after tasting it, how it changes again on, on the nose. And something, another note that is akin to red breast is that hallmark spiciness, that pepperiness, the mouth coating feature mm -hmm. of this whiskey. Then on the next sip has diversified the mm. flavor profiles. Um, and it's bright. I mean, it is a younger whiskey. It's two years old. Um, it's young, hot and sexy, just like the United States. Um, uh, so. <laughs> you have all the marketing. You, he has all the marketing lines from his, closer to the angels, and uh, that's right. <laughs> give them all ready for us. This is. Um, uh, I'm getting, that was not an approved statement. <laughs> that was not. No, and uh, we're we're gonna let Megan take it over from here because I I, I trust her notes far more than I trust yours, Patrick. Um, and I'm yeah. sure you'll you'll agree with me, Megan. Uh, I get I get like banana that's and I and I mean this in a good in a good way. It's banana that's that's uh, two days past ripe. It's like a mushy banana. Yeah, and and you know, like you'd almost make little little baby food for for a baby. You'd mush up the banana for them, and it's a uh, it's 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 soft, but it's it's a lovely note to it. And then a white pepper. There's a white pepper on the on the palate after that banana. That white pepper just lingers in the back of the tongue. Definitely, and I think on this batch, I've also um, right, especially like right when we bottled it or when we were choosing barrels to bottle it, um, I got just an insane amount of milk chocolate, like not a dark chocolate, but a milk chocolate. Um, and then I always say like our quarter cask whiskey, I call it the mold wine of whiskey. It's a good like Christmas spices, baking spices notes. Um, I think we have a lot of cardamom um, in our like just base spirit. Um, and so I think whenever you put it in a barrel, it really pulls out a lot of that cardamom as well. Mm. There's a dry tannin like finish to it too, isn't there? It's um, you're licking your lips after it almost as if it's dried your lips a little bit and you're you need another sip very cleverly engineered to make you want to taste a little bit more. Oh yeah. And I think that uh, too is a, is one of those virgin oak artifacts where new oak has a more tannic quality to it. Um, obviously one of those things in a second fill barrel uh, that you have spent a lot of that in the first fill it's, it's mm -hmm. imparted itself into the spirit. So you have a much more diverse, um, uh, boldness to a first fill whiskey where the second fill whiskey uh, in any cask has less to draw from. Um, and sometimes for better and sometimes for worse. Another thing with this berry in the quarter cask is this will not continue to grow in significant age statement um, because of the angel share loss here and yeah. the loss of liquor in the barrel without the loss of tannins can make it, uh, there's a balance to be struck between the amount of right. tannins available um, and that evaporation ratio. So we're actually, and we haven't actually said this publicly yet, we're switching this over to a Solera cask. So we have footers coming in, um, 30 barrel footers that we will put our quarter casks in and Solera every batch from here on out to get it out of that smaller Virgin American white oak barrel and allow it to mellow and marry with sister barrels that are that are inside of that that Solera cask. Help our audience understand the Solera system most associated with sherry aging. Um, not tip a hard, much harder thing to do in the very regulated world of, of, of liquor, but help us understand exactly what a Solera system is. Um, yes, it is something, uh, and Glenfiddich actually have a Solera, um, that they have a good 
uh, if you want to go and and see it in a more visual way, they have a very nice kind of uh, diagram on my on their website. I believe if it's a uh, uh, if it's still available. Effectively, it is taking a portion, say one third of the whiskey out of a large batch of whiskey, and then adding in new newly aged barrels into that. So over time, the age of the Solera and the development of the Solera changes as you remove just a portion, you never empty that cask, just a portion of it. And then you put in new whiskey on top of that that has been recently aged out of, out of a smaller size barrel. Um, and, in, and in Sherry, they'll put that into the same cask. So they'll use a Sherry cask will then pull a third of the sherry barrel out. Oh, there you go, fantastic. And add that in to, to the next batch. So for us, we'll have a single batch of sherry, sorry, a single batch of whiskey that we'll then pull out of, add whiskey onto that for every subsequent batch that is bottled. So it'll be a minimum of two years old. Um, but then over time, we'll develop into a, a much older whiskey, but it allowed us to stop the virgin oak entrance into the whiskey, if that makes sense, um, that stays the tannin influence on the spirit and allows it to mellow between batches of whiskey that are pulled from that Solera. So over the, over the two years, it'll get from the top of the of the Solera system, the, the third Criadera, down to the Solera layer, and you'll bottle it then at approximately two years, but it will have had the influence of multiple batches and multiple uh, yeah ex exposing in, in different ways to the wood uh, and, and you yeah. think that'll reduce the tannins ultimately and make it a will that be a less dry wine or or, or whiskey what will be the ultimate impact of that so i don't that that is to be seen barry we're in this uh, at the same pace that you are actually so <laughs> this idea the the tannin level if it doesn't reduce the dryness what it will do is change the complexity of those tannins and give those tannins more time to break into compounds or esterify, change into those uh, change into those compounds that are much more associative with a refined spirit instead of the sharper, younger oak notes. Uh, it just allows time for really the edges or the shoulders to be taken off of that right, um, right. that, that and makes Andrew, sense Andrew is it, it is yeah. it is a glorified it's a giant in, yeah almost like an infinity cask pyramid um, yep it's I've tasted many new makes new make or not new make but uh, three year old or three and a half year old Irish whiskeys that can be quite burn they can burn on the throat they're quite hot there's a heat to this, but it's not a, it, it's balanced by this, the, the virgin American oak giving those peppery notes, mm -hmm. soften the harshness of a younger, non super long aged whiskey. Yep. And it doesn't, it doesn't feel harsh. And and so it's a bit like the, the, the approach with, we talked about Waterford whiskey and I've, I've tasted their new spirits, their new whiskeys. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's when you're, you're changing the process of getting to the three years or the three and a half years in Ireland, and in this case, it's a little bit shorter. Once you're, yeah, my, I lost my train of thought, but there's a there's a way to balance out that heat, which you've managed to succeed in doing there, where it, and, it, 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 yeah, for such a young whiskey. Yeah, I, I really appreciate it. It means a lot, uh, and that and it goes back as well. That that assessment is. Uh, where we are and how it, and how it's aged. Um, mm. That amount of angel share in our young age here, it's our best friend. It's not your best friend when you're trying to make a 10 year old whiskey and you only have a quarter barrel left because you've had so much angel share, right? I mean, effectively in Colorado, yeah. you have to climb a control to get uh, anything 10 years or, or over. Right, um, right. Uh, but that is 100% the advantage of where we are is that the angels take their share but transform those tannic qualities of the new oak bound into the spirit that really 
helps soften that whiskey and gives it, I think, to uh, something that making this whiskey uh, would be really interesting somewhere like in Florida or Maine or Oregon. Just to see uh, the different impacts of the temperature and you the see that. environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't the angels great? We should, you know, they, they are. They're great altogether. They're great. They we, are. <laughs> we don't, we don't celebrate the angels. Normally, it's the, the chief financial officer of the distillery shaking his arm at the sky, uh, his fist at the sky, complaining about the angels. But in this case, they've given us a nice exchange. Um, they have. I want oh, to uh, were... go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, uh, listening to the Jameson lock-in, the shocking statistic of. 30 some thousand bottles a day and an angel share. Uh, I mean, those, right. it, it is a real, it's an economic consideration. We, you know, we have oh, to no know doubt. that to build in that understanding, but yeah. Yeah. But, but of course, if we, if it didn't happen, we wouldn't have whiskey. We just have yep. a, a clear spirit, which nobody yep. wants. Let's be honest. Yep. Nothing against your gins or vodkas. Um, nope. The, nope, we got it. <laughs> so, to ground folks in the distillation side of things and without getting into too much technical detail, what's interesting to me is, uh, I'm, first of all, not getting into the technical detail because I'm in no way qualified to talk about it, but Redbreast 12 is uh, triple distilled. And when we say triple distilled, in the case of Middleton, it has gone through three different stills. Now, I was very surprised to learn that your single pot still whiskey is also triple distilled, but you've only got one still. And I walked into the still room and I was looking around and I said, well, I see one still. And I was wondering where the other ones. <laughs> yep. Yep. Would you do us a favor? Can, is it possible to turn the camera around and show the corner there at all? I wonder. Absolutely. Not, just put so, an image up. And, and uh, um, I'll, I'll show you guys uh, here. And forgive, uh, we've just started tearing things out. So um, it, we, we've lost our spirit tank at this point. Uh, we've disassembled that. Um, so we've started to move several things around here. But I'll, I'll walk you over this Our way. first ever distillery tour so, live. Look at this. Here you are, right? So here Amazing. is actually our gin still. So that gin still sitting closest to me with a stainless steel bottom, she just makes gin. Um, that's really because... If you put botanicals into copper, you really have to be careful about what you are um, distilling after that. Cleaning that out can be very difficult. It's a little bit easier with a column still. Um, it is not easy. So we have our gin still that does all of our gin. And then, like I said, we've torn, we've torn everything out over here. There used to be spirit tanks over here. Um, this was that original still, that still that we got from uh, the previous distillery that we took over, um, they so kindly made us a, what, like I said, looks like a, an American moonshine still, um, akin to many Puccine stills in Ireland as well. Um, so this still, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to clean this out every single time. Like this is, this is a very difficult part of our process and a slow part of our process because we have to, um, clean this thoroughly in between every distillation so it's truly a labor a labor of of love here and while we are here so you guys can see this is our brew house so this is something that you see in many american kind of craft distilleries uh it is a uh uh louder ton combo um, you can see in here uh, actually has a false bottom that the barley can sit on uh, and rakes inside to give us a nice even grain bed. So that is our mashing apparatus. Uh, our boil kettle, of course, is where we pasteurize our liquid uh, by killing all of that bacteria. We then have a clean wort that we can put into fermentation. So fermentation are our glorified dairy tanks, um, which are leaving here in two days. Um, this is going to be replaced by five conical fermenters, uh, and that will really change our production capacity. So you're seeing version one with the tasting room there in the background, um, uh, our very original distillery, um, a small operation, uh, but growing this wall will effectively go away. So we have a lot of changes that are going to happen here. Um, so kind of happy that you all, if you haven't been here or seen this before, um, this is version one to be replaced by version two here um, very, very soon. Uh, and here's here's the little one. Uh, She's she's down here saying hi to you all this evening as well. 
Sorry, Barry. I think I hit mute on you. Employee number seven there wagging its tail. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Exactly. Uh, yeah, we're trying to get her to pull her weight a little bit more around here, but uh, um, she's been she's been uh, fighting fighting that. Um, loves the barley component of this job, though. That's for sure. Is that right? <laughs> I, I appreciate that tour. This is the first, not only the first American distillery we've had as part, probably the last, but uh, also the first ever live tour of a distillery, uh, which is really exciting for our audience. And uh, already people really, really thrilled to see, uh, to get a tour of the distillery. Um, when I was there, um, I saw that, uh, yeah, the, the spirit um, safe, or not the spirit safe, the... Yep. It, the yeah the in spirit, the corner we and call I was, it our spirit safe it's spirit yeah, tank, it's no, yeah there's nothing safe about it but yeah <laughs> nothing safe no but i was i was so surprised to learn that you emptied the empty the still into the spirit tank cleaned out the still when put took the spirit back in to the second distillation and back and back i mean that really is an incredible uh dedication to creating the whiskey there's no doubt about it it is and and you know on a on a i mean this this really is a mom and pop operation. It is a very uh, small craft distillery that we are growing from from really humble beginnings into something we uh, have big dreams for. So I'm glad you all kind of got to see the the, the process of it, the, the, the view. Um, we pretty much live here. So it's uh, a special place to us. Uh, and I'm really glad we got to kind of be the very first um, <laughs> Very first distillery. Uh, the Middleton tour is a bit longer uh, than Just, our. It's about, it's about 30 seconds hours. longer. Yeah. yeah. About 30 <laughs> yeah, seconds yeah, longer. Yeah. We'll, we'll try and do that one on the lock in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I believe those tours for everything that they're worth, though. I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk your ear off. Agreed. When you were walking around there, you turned the, the camera around and I could see there was a whole bunch of, um, of um, IBCs, uh, the tanks of, of, of liquid mm -hmm. behind you. Are, do any of those contain um, spirit from Ireland? Because um, my understanding is that your blend has something to do with Ireland. Tell us about the blend. Yeah, absolutely. So um, what we did, one of those totes actually is one of the ones that, that came over from Ireland. Um, we use those as we have a scale in here as well so that we can cut spirit down by weight. It's much more accurate. So those totes allow us the ability to transfer that around, forklift that around um, and maneuver that uh, within the distillery. So when we bring whiskey over, it's actually from the Cooley distillery in Ireland. It's a grain whiskey uh, made predominantly out of French maize, um, distilled on their column stills. Uh, and so if you've ever had Kilbegan single grain, very similar to, to that style of, of whiskey, that, we then bring over, after it's been aged for three years, it then goes into a bourbon cask, an ex-bourbon cask here mm. and sits in our warehouse. So we actually use barrel storage um, until that is ready for the next batch. So um, it's one of those things we hear, and it's something you, you find at every distillery, um, you go up against what are called MAQs. It's your maximum allowable quantity of spirit over 20% alcohol. You can only have so much in a distillery um, without having H3 fire rooms and things like that. So long-term storage cannot be in plastic containers or steel containers. It can, however, be in an oak barrel. The theory behind that is if, if it really goes up in flames in here, oak burns but does not explode. Whereas a pressurized plastic vessel or a pressurized stainless vessel can detonate uh, at, at the right at the right temperatures and pressures. So oak, while it would cause a raging fire, you can put out a raging fire. Um, dampening explosions is a much more difficult thing. So yeah, MAQs no are are right are born of that um, uh, okay. that fire code. And so we get that in, and it goes into barrels that day. Um, Legally, however, for it to be stored in the United States, one of those interesting things is that Cooley whiskey came over at like 128 proof. Earlier, I mentioned that 125 proof is the maximum proof at which whiskey can be aged in the United States. So we actually have to cut that down 
um, I cut it down to just about 120 um, to put okay. it in those second fill bourbon barrels uh, where it will rest until it's married in, in our batch or blended. It is there nothing easy in your process? It's just, is there anything it's, efficient in this process at all? <laughs> it, it is not. And, and this is the thing that I love to tell people. Triple distilling whiskey is not efficient. Um, triple dis distilled whiskey doesn't hide anything either. I mean, there's a lot to be exposed about the quality of the underlying spirit um, when, it's, when it's triple distilled. Um, mashing unmalted barley takes way longer than mashing a single malt whiskey, almost twice as long uh, to produce you know when, a match. Do you know when triple distilled whiskey is efficient? When you actually have three stills. So it is, this is going to is, change for you. It is going <laughs> to change, soon. which is we are so excited about. Um, I, I mean, I can't even tell you how excited I am for, for that to be to be in here. Uh, it's, it's going to allow it to flow in our process in a much more meaningful, dedicated way. Um, and and to be honest, because why not, uh, it'll make a cleaner spirit as well um, because distilling no no in a wash still um, has a lot of undesirables uh, that you're shedding. The, the attempt is that you you get all of the good stuff out and leave the bad stuff behind, but the bad stuff touched the pot. Uh, it's also right. why for us, it is so important. Fermentations are so important because mm. we, if we don't have clean fermentations, we don't have clean distillate. And so we make a beer that you would like to drink. I guarantee it. That beer would be a very nice, bright. It's both malty and grassy. Uh, it has a really wonderful body to it. Those fermentations, again, we use a brewer's yeast as well, and we harvest that yeast for subsequent generations of, uh, of brews. So we have a very complicated process. Uh, very complicated, which, very complicated. At which point <laughs> everything takes longer than making a bourbon or a single malt whiskey. Um, and it is just something that is part of it, efficiency, the beauty of pot still whiskey is in the inefficiency. Well, if you're just joining us, we are here in uh, Talnua Distillery. Well, I'm not in Talnua Distillery. I was last week. Uh, Patrick and Megan, co-founders of Talnua Distillery, are here to talk to us about single pot still whiskey. And it's unusual for us to hear American accents talking about single pot still whiskey. <laughs> Normally, there'd be a there'd be a, a, a Cork accent. Uh, leaning in on the single pot still uh, instruction and overview, but not tonight. Um, we're going to move on to the other single, your your other single pot still whiskey in your lineup, an annual release. Um, we're going to move on to that in a second. Um, for those of you who have just joined, you're very welcome. Uh, if it's your first time here, this is the lock in live stream. We do this every Friday night. It's a chance to get together to meet each other virtually online to raise a glass, toast each other, toast our health, and uh, really remove and end as much isolation as we can in these challenging times and find somewhere for us to share our love for a common, uh, sp uh, an uncommon love or a, a common love for an uncommon spirit is what we really have here with, with, with whiskey. Um, I had the, the pleasure of visiting Talnua Distillery and doing a tasting of their, of their flight of whiskeys and some mocktails. By the way, your old fashions, maybe the greatest old fashions I've, I've had ever and i'm a i'm a real old-fashioned snob but they're amazing thank you yeah. we're pretty proud of them we have I, I this is a shout out to maya and adam they are amazing at what they do back behind the bar so um we're also limited we are not allowed to have any um sort of alcohol that we do not make so we can't have vermouth or campari or things like that mm. um so we have to get really really creative so yesterday we actually um squished and deep pitted or pitted um, probably five pounds of tiny plums. Um, so everything is done by hand here and, and including the cocktails. <laughs> it, it, they're not an efficient form either. <laughs> you know, I, it's funny you mentioned earlier, Patrick, Waterford Distillery, another distillery that is completely inefficient. If you were, if it was being run by a financial controller, it would be shut down in the morning. And, and <laughs> I'm sure you've had similar discussions yourselves with your own financial team. Uh, but yep. I, I will, ju ju as we're on the topic of Waterford, it is worth sharing and uh, not to invade on your own space, but Waterford yep. um, is now available in the United States, Waterford Whiskey, the first 
release is from the Dunbell Farm in County Kilkenny. And the link to buy that, if anyone's interested in getting hold of an online-only release of Waterford Whiskey, which is following the most inefficient processes known to man <laughs> or animal to make their whiskey, but producing an incredible spirit. You'll find those links in our Facebook group, Irish Whiskey Fans yeah. of America, and I'd encourage you to, to do that. Megan and Patrick, tell me what I have here in front of me. So this is our special release for 2020. This is uh, what we called Old Saints Keep because it is released uh, on St. Patrick's Day, which is our anniversary. We opened in on St. Patrick's Day of 2019. Every year, Old Saints Keep will be different. It'll change. It'll have different nuances. It may be distilled differently or aged differently. Um, and we get gives us a real chance to be creative. And something that I had not seen coming out of uh, Irish pot stills, at least that we had access to, again, um, you know, not being in New York, uh, we, we're we not first at the table for what we're able to get here in the, in the Denver market. However, um, port was one of those influences that there, there weren't very many of, uh, and not many uh, in, in general. Port, I think, is one of those beautiful whiskey uh, influencers that, when done well, adds that ruby, dark plum note and, and can add a, a very textural layer, but also a um, substantive dark fruit layer to, to the whiskey. So I wanted to try that out. It's a, this is another scary thing because I don't know what these whiskeys are going to taste like until we are ready to bottle these. I mean, I, I have about a month's worth of time that if it doesn't do what I need it to do, I, I have to figure out and scramble. Um, these uh, tawny, I'm sorry, uh, ruby port barrels really imparted that sweet dried fruit note. Um, if you're familiar with, with sweeter ports, there's just a ton of... Uh, depth and elegance and silkiness uh, that lies in that port that I think really translated as a beautiful overlay to our quarter cask. So this would have been our quarter cask whiskey aged then in a second fill port cask uh, and coming straight from Portugal. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy with how this turned out. Uh, I wouldn't doubt if you would see this coming down the line as a more regular part of our anthology in the next few years. Um, that port influence kind of entering our casking process, um, at least in a line of our whiskeys. Um, and so are you, it's- Are you finishing this in the in a full size port pipe or is it a smaller? Yes. You are. Yep, so it was, it was an amalgam of quarter casks that were then divvied into larger port casks for the finish. So what would be the total age then of this? Uh, how, how long would this have been maturing for in total? So you have to put on, um, just like in Ireland or Scotland, you have to put on the youngest aged barrel prior yeah. to um, this new aging scheme uh, that is allowed um, not to get too into the weeds with it. it the TTB required you to basically say only the age of the whiskey that was the first influence on spirit. And it irritated a lot of people because some people will say, you know, I put it in a, a, a bourbon barrel in a year and I take it out and then I put it in a sherry barrel for a year and I put it in, right? And so there was all this casking that happened, but they were only allowed to say 12 months old because that was the first barrel that it was put into. Well, uh, similar in this case, the barrels of quarter cask that comprise this whiskey were 20 months old. We then allowed it to sit for an additional six months in that cask. So the ultimate age time is 26. That's why you get okay. 20 months on the label in quarter casks, yep. then put into port cask for an additional six months of finishing. I see. Okay. Well, be, before I, I knows this, I, I, I didn't yet explain or give any feedback on the quarter cask and Steve Smathers did call me out and rightfully so that I didn't give my <laughs> thoughts on it. Um, it's a remarkably different single pot still. And I've tried some of the new single pot stills that have come out of Ireland that have ba barely made their 
legal requirement for aging. And I've not been, uh, I'm the first to say I wasn't super impressed and I felt that they needed a lot longer. Um, it does seem like that you have found a better balance and I'm sure it's the quarter cast contribution and that speed of maturation that is helping that process. But the fact that I'm getting the notes from the caskets in such a short period of time, like that white pepper from the virgin oak, mm -hmm. and there's a lovely dryness. So it, to me, it's it's banana meets white pepper meets um, a kind of a dry tannic finish. It's, it's a lovely, lovely sipping whiskey. Uh, I wouldn't add water to it. I would sip it as it is. And I think it's a remarkable whiskey to be putting into old fashions. Uh, so I, I mean, credit where credit is due. Um, if I had gone through the tasting in Talnua and I had not liked the whiskey, we might not be sitting here tonight because I, <laughs> there's no point in telling people in advertising bad spirit, but we're here because it's good and that's a good thing. So, um, I wanted to make that point before we moved on to old saints keep. I, I don't, Thank you, Mary. <laughs> I was going to, you don't know how much that means to us. I mean, this. Like I said, this is you're you're witnessing a dream here, so um, it really oh, it great. really means a it really means a lot to us to to be here and to to hear that it's it's very special. And there, I mean, it's great to see the versatility within the style of single pot still within that 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 you can make a very different single pot still whiskey than we would know in Ireland. And what yeah. a homogenous world it would be if we'd only known once one approach to single pot still so kudos for that and and may we see many more uh, approaches to it and uh rolls of the dice when it comes to this uh because you're you're risking you're putting your money where your mouth is and uh <laughs> i know that's that's not as you know that that's got to keep you up at night but yeah very impressed with the with the whiskey and um uh, i've tried this old saints keep too and uh, i'm excited to get your notes on it because i've got some thoughts so um patrick you can't say a word on this now this is only megan's Got it. <laughs> okay. That's not fair. We, we are a team. He, he can talk sometimes. <laughs> All right. Sometimes, I'll, I'll let you sometimes. be the judge of... Megan gets to judge when Patrick can talk on this one. Okay. Who <laughs> wants to talk right now? <laughs> um, Stacy says that she's tried a lot of whiskey this year, and Old Saints Keep is one of the best she's tried. And Stacy is a whiskey connoisseur and a big fan of Irish single pot still. Thank you, Stacy. All right, girl, what do you have? Um, I mean, on the nose, I definitely get a lot of vanilla. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I have to talk to you. I don't I know. Have this. I've actually you don't have the script down? Well, this year. We don't have a script. <laughs> last year, I helped myself to Old Saints Keep, you know, for my last dram of the night most nights. Um, this year, I've actually limited myself on how much I've, you know, allowed my myself to to consume of, you know, this, because we're already down to like 40 bottles. So um, from 450, <laughs> wow. mm -hmm. <laughs> so I just want to cherish it more. Um, I, a lot of those, I get a lot of raisin notes, dried, dried kind of plumminess and raisiny yep. notes. Yep. Uh, Plum is what I was going to mm -hmm. say. And that's a hundred percent pork work, the work of that pork barrel. Yep. Yep. I definitely get that. The, the dry, maybe even the stewed, stewed raisins. Mm -hmm. Um, there is that, there's a, there's a, dry, even a dryness on the nose. Mm -hmm. I, I have, it's um, funny. Own, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Um, we have the a only, big, old... we'll dance. We'll do yeah. a little dance. <laughs> uh, we have a fig old fashion right now and this actually, like the nose on this is very, very similar to the actual fig fruit that we put into yeah. our old fashioned. The only other single pot still I have at the moment that's uh, got a port influence is, well, there's two of them. It's the red breast 27 year old and the red breast 28 year old. And um, both of those at the end of the night, when, when I'm finished with what's in my glass, they leave this white residue, this this residue in the inside of the glass. And I was confused as to why it was there. And uh, smarter uh, palates and minds than mine told me that that was the port that was the uh, that was leaving behind this residue on the glass that I'd not seen before. Now, I wonder, does that appear on these glasses? I haven't seen it yet. I, I have a little bit. I, I haven't noticed it because um, I, I would assume, I don't know if I not actually sure what that compound is. I'm assuming mm. a, a resin of of the kind of wine influence there perhaps, but um, I haven't noticed that on 
empty glasses, even at the distillery, I think, yeah, as I much. Um, I know, and it, and it may be an experiment for viewers tonight yeah. who have their hands on it. Steve, leave. what's the answer? <laughs> Steve, Julie. Roll it around your yeah. glass. Yeah, leave, <laughs> leave yeah. it there. This is, um, this is very different to the quarter cask, isn't it? Which is amazing because it is quarter cask with just that port influence. I, and this is one of the things that we love to showcase with people and telling them is like, look what casks do to the maturation of spirit. I mean, they really are magical creatures that, that change the influence and the nuance and the way that we receive that. Um, getting the grain influence is part of it. Um, the cask influence is another one of those uh, scenarios that you can change and diversify a spirit line significantly um, with the introduction of different cask finishes. Uh, we also had a peated cask. So we had a peated single pot still as well that I got barrels from Lafroy um, that we did that people have been asking for, but because of tariffs and issues that exist, um, Scotland is not, a, not in the mood to send craft distillers um, uh, whiskey barrels at, at, at the moment. So I have to be creative with coming up with that peat smoke again at some point because yes. having a peated pot still whiskey was brilliant without having to add peat malt to the still. Another influence that can really taint the still in a good way when you want that, but just like gin botanicals can influence the flavor of the distillate. I didn't want to put peated malt into that still. Um, and right. so we did it by finishing it in Lafroig barrels. And Lafroig has more than enough peat influence to um, impart itself just like this port cask does uh, here. The, the port, it, it, it alters the nose significantly and yep. then it seems to pare down or pare back the pepper, the spice a little bit and it brings a little bit of that fruit, not a, not a massive amount of fruit, but yep. enough to say there's something there that's red or a light, maybe a reddy brown Yep, fruit contribution. I think in colors. I think taste, taste, and colors together. It it definitely does. And and there's a slight influence. I'm not sure if you can see it here, but there really is that kind of that ruby wine color translated through. You have much better equipment um, than I do, but there is a very nice, almost purplish hue. That ruby hue that really came in um, uh, from from that port. And you're exactly right. The the flavor, the interesting thing is that that is actually 90 proof whiskey where yeah. the quarter cask is 86. So not significantly higher, but you would assume that it would be a more bitey version of that. And instead that wine characteristic really rounded that, that profile out. Um, and yeah, like I said, yeah. very proud of this. Again, these are those gambles that we roll the dice and uh, if it, if it works great, if it doesn't, then, you know, we have to, we have to scramble and figure out. So both of ours, right. our old saints have, have done really well. And, and I'm really excited. Uh, I would tell you what this year's uh, is going to be, but I don't actually know that yet. We, we really do wait until one to two months before to pull available casks together and things that we have in the works to taste and, and pair things because individually they might be interesting, nuanced and complex, but put together, they might not play well in the sandbox together. So it's important right. for us to, to hash that out and, and create something kind of new, really leading up to the date. We're also young enough that if I taste it now, six months before uh, we're going to pull it from that cask, the the amount that it can change uh, could make it unrecognizable. So making decisions about what, what 2021 is going to be um, is difficult. I can tell you it will have sherry influence in it somewhere i can almost guarantee uh, that will be a when do you uh, make that announcement typically uh, when have you made that historically each year usually we do it uh right around that that first week of march the first of march um yeah. to to let people know what they'll be getting on the 17th um this year uh, or say 2021 I believe it falls on a wednesday uh march 17th so we always do our 
anniversary on the Saturday and Sunday before. We have two days of live music and pipe bands and um, Irish sessions and, and Irish food um, to, to do part of that real celebration of the release of Old Saints. Um, and so that'll be, I think it must be the 12th and 13th or 13th and 14th of this year uh, of 2021, excuse me. And, you know, hoping at that point we can all gather to again, uh, together again safely and, and enjoy that. Those are special times for us as well. And, and that name, Old Saints, comes from yeah. that kind of uh, lore or legend that uh, this, the Irish monks created whiskey, invented the spirit. And um, it always was the, the keep of the abbey uh, or the what the monks would keep to themselves was the best, the top shelf. And so we have on St. Patrick's Day, the old saints keep kind of an homage to St. Patrick uh, and the early Irish monks who invented this spirit, uh, but also our, our anniversary and our kind of top shelf, our special release that we've yes. put a lot of, a lot of thought into every year. It's your, your dream cask every year here. It's here our it dream cask. It. it is. Just increase, just increase the price to about four or $500 just to, to compare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, hey, you know what? I, it's if, if people will buy it, you know that it is a funny thing. That is one thing that we are very price conscious. So, you know, even when we're talking about our comparisons here with with Red Breast, I, I purchased mine for um, $60 from a, a liquor store here in town. And I mean, ours is $40 on that same shelf sitting about, yes. um, you know, 10 rows down from from Red Breast. Uh, and so that that has uh, something that we're really price conscious on this, this being a little bit more special um, and a single release. And especially because we really feel the cost of those barrels and th that creativity also comes, comes with a price point of shipping barrels no over no from doubt. Portugal. The, um, when, when, I, when I first started learning about single pot still and listening to brand ambassadors talk about what we should be feeling in our mouths and what we should be tasting, the characteristic component notes or, or characteristics of a single pot still being that creaminess in the mouth and that spice and that coating on the mouth. And for the longest time, I couldn't get that. I was, I was like, where, where is this? I mean, I'm, it's in my mouth and I, yet I, I'm not getting this, sure. this, uh, these notes. And I, I remember mentioning this to our friends when we were in, in, in the distillery, in the tasting room at Talnua, that these might be the first whiskeys where the spice in terms of that peppery component of the single pot still, for me, has come through so obviously. I can absolutely say that's a single pot still. Uh, mm -hmm. More so than many of those, especially the younger single pot stills coming out of Ireland, they're, they're, oh, the, the spice and the creaminess and that mouth coating is overpowered by an alcohol-forward, spirit-forward, yeah. unfortunately not yet fully wood-balanced yep. element. Um, and that's not here. Whereas now, I've been washing this around my mouth I need to brush my teeth after this. And that's a good thing because it's coating my mm -hmm. mouth. It's coating my teeth. That's what pot yep. still should do. Um, had a fantastic conversation um, with Bernard Walsh uh, in 2017. Yes. And of Writer's Tears and, of uh, writer's the, tears Irishman. and the Irishman. Um, and his hospitality, we were at Royal Oak at, um, um, at Walsh Distillery at the time. Um, his hospitality, I, I mean, we can't speak enough of how amazing uh, he treated us as starting this little craft distillery. And he said, uh, one thing that really stuck with me was making pot still whiskey comes with it an inherent danger that it has a lingering quality to it. And if it lingers and it's a negative quality, there's no hiding that. Uh, but it can be the most special part about the whiskey if it lingers and develops and, and becomes a, a special part of, of that. Yeah. And I've thought yeah. a, about, a lot about that because, again, with, with more um, linear flavor profiled whiskeys that don't have that coating mouthfeel, that, that unmalted barley really imparts on the spirit, um, you put yourself in a danger zone of that sticking around and being unfriendly. Um, and I've been very proud, um, not too proud to say how proud I am of, of that quality of the lingering factor existing yeah. there. Um, but not 
not being offensive over time, but it's, but you know, to, it's not going anywhere. I mean, it definitely sticks around with you uh, over time. We, what, we can what also am I getting? Give, go ahead, Megan. Sorry, I keep interrupting you. No, <laughs> we can also fault. give Bernard um, credit for, for telling us to get a gin still uh, to not taint our whiskey mm -hmm. still. <laughs> he was like, whatever you do, do not. And I was a distiller before too. So he definitely, he definitely, I mean, all of a sudden we came back from Ireland and it was like, we've got to buy another still. Like we can't, yeah. we can't put <laughs> botanicals in there. He's exactly right. It was one of those oversights of, you know, trying to get up and get going. Right. It, was, uh, it was one of those expensive uh, trip. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. Um, but when, when I'm tasting, when, when I'm getting that, that lingering, I, I mentioned, especially with the quarter cask to begin with that dry feeling um, near the end. What is that dry feeling that I'm getting? Is it a high tannin content? What is it that I'm experiencing? Do you think? I believe it is that tannic quality. Um, I don't, I'm just making it up at this point. I don't actually know. I would love to do and to be able to afford kind of a mass spectrometer of the compounds present um, that would really give us that indication. It is tannins, right? You have a high tannic proportion. We know we do. You always do with virgin American oak, especially relative yes. to um, any second fill bourbon cask, which is a much more familiar experience. Sounds like that you've had, of course, with some of the newer pot still whiskeys coming out of Ireland. Um, that, that tannic quality um, over time theoretically would shift in dryness profile to a sweeter profile um however with virgin american oak you'll always have more tannins than you ever would in a second fill cask that's one of those first things especially in the charring process um, that caramelization of the inside of the barrel makes a lot of that soluble and available. And so when that's in a fresh charred oak barrel, the accessibility and the bonding quality between the ethanol, which is at, at the heart of it, a solvent, and the tannic and lignin, the actual wood particles being broken down, accompanied by the hemicellulose, which is the structure of the actual veins of the tree, um, all of those compounds are being disassembled and broken down by a process called al alcolysis. And alcolysis has broken these compounds down. You know how floating compounds of wood into a spirit base. And then that angel share starts to come into play where those compounds start to esterify and change over time. But your proportion of tannins will always be higher in a virgin American oak, anything. Uh, French oak, would be even higher than that, right? Limousine oak from France yep. has an, yep. an even higher tannic quality. Um, it's also why typically French oak is is aged for more nuance over time or as a part of the casking profile. There's very few whiskeys that are just 100% French oak. Um, they can be more tannin forward um, right. when it's a nice balance, like you mentioned, it's great. But when it's the overriding component, uh, it can, it can be bitter and, and significantly drier. Yes. Than the consumer might want. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, Peter says you should take this spirit to your local university and I'm sure some professors would have a mass spectrometer there. It's a good idea. That's true. Um, Maybe do a little whiskey trade. We can do that. There you go. Who, who will turn down some whiskey? <laughs> Um, Ed says he's surprised the oak isn't parting more vanilla. Well, I, my understanding is that the vanilla we typically get, especially the one we're familiar with in Irish whiskey, would be a, the vanilla compound found in the, the ex-bourbon barrels and that, that the bourbon is imparting the vanilla rather than the, the, the wood. Would I be right there, Patrick? So I think, if again, if we did a mass spectrometer, I think that what we would find is that the vanillin compound is there. There are just much louder notes. And so there are things speaking over the top of that vanilla where inherently vanilla um, is a fairly gentle flavor profile. And with that new American oak, there's just more happening there where you're exactly right. In that second fill bourbon cask, some of the other notes have been equally pulled back that allows vanilla to be an equal part of that narrative right. of the whiskey. Whereas in, yeah. in ours, 
there's just a more bold pr profile that it's competing with. Um, so it lies underneath instead of being more present yes. in the front of this whiskey. That makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a lovely whiskey. Um, I'm, I'm loving the component analysis that we're doing and I'm trying to understand what I'm getting here versus what I might get in an Irish single pot still, but they're just very different beasts. I think um, they're, they're similar in, in name only. And I think that's okay. I think you're, you've got this wonderful expression, two expressions that are inspired by, they're not derived from an Irish single pot still they're inspired by, and you're, you're following the technical file, but you're using the best of the ingredients you have locally and a unique local approach in Denver to or in Colorado to, to make the spirit that you have. And I don't think anybody should compare these alongside each other. I made that point in the group earlier this week. Somebody shouted at me for trying to compare Redbreast 12 year old with your whiskeys. I said, well, it's not really a comparison as much as a side by side. Yeah. It's a love, it's a love in, it's a love fest for all of these together. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and I think, uh, you know, two, two things. One, uh, that, that red breast, uh, anytime I try whiskeys, I rarely ever try them in a vacuum. I always try something next to something my palate is very locked in and geared towards, whether it be a single malt of a certain style, a pot still, or a bourbon of a certain style. Because tasting things in what I consider a vacuum taints the flavors. If there's no way to, if you're not setting, true north somewhere in your mind tasting right. things in a vacuum give you different flavors if you had a bowl of you know marinara pasta before you tried this and uh, uh it would be a very different experience so having something to try uh part of the reason i love she also knows how much i love marinara <laughs> pasta uh but <laughs> but having having red breasts is kind of helps people who have had an experience with pot still whiskeys before have what they self describe even on the bottle as the definitive style of, of pot still yes. whiskey. Um, having that as a way to then just understand, not compare even betters or worse, but understand where that whiskey is coming from, finding those notes and nuances that have found a divergence. Uh, how did that happen, right? Then there's a ton to uncover about a spirit and what it is and how it's made. The second thing on the back, I think you you nailed it, uh, is right up top. It says Gaelic tradition meets American pioneerism, right? That's exactly what you were just describing is the Irish heritage of this whiskey right. is the core value aspect of the production of our single pot still. However, so there it is an American expression of that with yeah, all of our yeah. grains and water and the way that we think about things and innovate and honestly a little bit more leeway that we have with some of the casking uh, production that we're able to do here that are prohibited by um, Irish law. Uh, th there are things that we can actually do um, by making a base spirit that is really driven and regulated and self-policed by that technical file, um, but but really bringing in all those fun additional elements that, that we we can and creating an Irish American identity. Well, there's it's a wonderful confluence of traditions, as you've mentioned, this Gaelic tradition meeting American pioneerism. But if we were to go back 200 years, the whiskey that would have been perhaps consumed the most in the United States would have been Irish single pot still whiskey um, prior to prohibition and its fall from grace and the, the overtaking of lighter blended whiskeys from Scotland and the rise of bourbon. And now that we have American <laughs> entrepreneurs <coughs> putting their stake in the ground and saying, we can make a single pot still, isn't it part of our heritage in so many ways is a wonderful thing and allows for great storytelling as well as great sipping, uh, which are two components that I think have to go hand in hand. So it's great to see, uh, to see what you're doing. And I'm a, I, I'm, I recommend the whiskeys. I'm a big fan of what you're doing. Uh, I had to try them to know whether this was something that would be of interest to me. I've, I, I never, I will never speak badly about a brand, but if you don't see a brand featured on anything I do, it's because I just don't like what, I don't like the taste or there's something that just doesn't fit. So I don't speak ill, I just don't feature. And that's the only, yep. I think it's the most diplomatic way, but very, I'm delighted to hero what you're doing. I think that once this world opens up a little bit more and we're 
it's easier for us all to travel. Um, your tasting room and the distillery seem like the perfect location for a, a Colorado meetup of the Irish whiskey fans of America um, for us all to do something fun there uh, when space and time and health and comfort levels permit. Absolutely. Always welcome here. And by then we'll have all the new equipment and stuff. So would love to do a, a tour and be able to show everybody around and, and delve more into that, how it's made. It's, it's much easier to see when you can stand and visualize the process. Uh, uh, would, would love to do that and, and obviously host as many of you uh, as, as we can fit uh, in, in the years to come. And actually we have to thank um, you, Barry and, um, some of our regulars for introducing us to you, actually. So, um, oh, hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for being Steve here. Steve and, and Julie. And yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've got some great folks in Colorado, great, great supporters of what I'm doing, and, and it sounds like what you're doing as well. And so, if we share friends, it means that there has to come a time when we're all in the same room together. It only makes sense. Um, I don't want to end uh, on, a, on a bad note or in any way give anybody bad news, but we've had so many questions about availability of this whiskey that <laughs> we're sitting here wetting people's appetite. And the sad news is that unless you actually go to Colorado, you're not going to get your hands on this right now, are you? Uh, uh, write your congressmen and your senators and let them know how unhappy you are with the current uh, state of uh, the ability for craft distillers to ship whiskey. Unfortunately, um, we have to be signed on with a, a fairly large distributor to go interstate. Um, the other reality is that we're still in the building phases of this distillery where we barely have enough to supply the metro area front range of, of Denver. Um, and so really, uh, it's a come visit us experience at the moment. Um, but a few years from now, uh, we will start to build the inventory required to get into to new states. We also in 2022 in April and May, um, we have new whiskey expressions coming out that are over three years old. So they'll meet those, uh, both a virgin American oak uh, expression that will be coming out um, but of course, these are all things that you can only get here in the first uh, as of next year as well. So sorry, I'm trying to bring <laughs> light of interest of, of diversity of profile for people who will show up in 2020. Um, but the second thing that we're doing um, is we're launching a cask and stave series where we age and second fill casks. But we also then stave those barrels with different styles of oak, different charred oaks. So you're getting a much more rounded oak profile within a single cast. You'll see some of our, our barrels back here behind me, especially uh, on this side, that will have a ex-bourbon barrel that has done the three years of aging, but we introduce staves into those casks that has developed and and broaden the oak profile within that three to four year old period, um, something that is not legal in Ireland. Um, however, right. staving here in the United States is, it's a page we took out of Cognac, France, um, and many winemakers that use barrels for years and years, 15, 20, 30 year old casks that they've put wine in every year and then staved to add that oak profile to um, and get diverse oak profiles within the same cask. So it also has an eco, eco component to it where barrels then live on uh, in a much longer time than, than would have uh, otherwise. So it's a way to give barrels additional life and a way to, to build a diversity of oak profiles while still aging for three, four, five years and beyond. Um, it's not a quick way of aging as you might think of throwing staves in to try to accomplish a flavor profile early, it still accomplishes a three plus year old age statement um, with a diverse profile uh, in the whiskey. So something to look forward to coming up here. Interesting. That's really interesting. Well, look, maybe we'll uh, maybe we need to come back to our our only featured American distillery when you've got your new stills installed, when you've got uh, more of these great releases uh, to talk about, and maybe we can continue our conversation. There's a lot of similarities and 
uh, alignment between what you're doing and what we in Ireland are interested in and, and, and believe. And I think we're all philosophically aligned. We're trying to make good whiskey that brings people together. And the fact that uh, you're sharing this kind of quintessential style of Irish whiskey is just so, so interesting to so many in the audience. Great comments that I'd encourage you to go back yourselves maybe tomorrow and look at Facebook and YouTube and see some of the great comments. I didn't put them all on the screen. They were coming in uh, hot and fast, but great <laughs> reception and, and people are really loving what you're doing. Um, let me see. There was one I wanted to put up here. Catherine says, you all rock this live cast. Can't wait to return to the distillery to see your changes. Um, Brian Redden is on to uh, round two of his old saints. <laughs> keep. Johnny uh, says to keep working hard. You have a great slice of an untapped whiskey world. And uh, you're being encouraged to get more old saints keep. <laughs> and um, let me see. Yes. Uh, we also had Matt Healy here. Matt, a uh, buddy of ours in Ireland. Matt has been to your distillery. Hey, Matt. Matt of Um I know that you did a very in-depth technical discussion of distillation. So for those of you who are particularly interested in tech, the technical aspects of everything from grain silos to uh, grain vacuums, etc. Matt has gone into detail with you on that. So check on potstill.com for an interview with, with you and, and Matt. And uh, I understood you. You couldn't get rid of Matt. He stayed there for six or seven hours. He wouldn't leave. He was so interested in talking about American whiskey with you. <laughs> well, yeah, once upon a time when we were allowed to be in the same room, uh, it, it was uh, we had we had such a fun uh, a fun day. Uh, but you got two talkers in the same. I know right? we got talking, and it was it was hours of hours of time. So uh, I, I can't tell you it's it was it, it's been a fun time. A little bit of whiskey, just like this. I hope we get a face to face someday soon here uh, as sure. well, because because it because we it really is special to be able to. And we really appreciate you also making the pilgrimage out here. Um, we know you you could have done a lot of other things while you're in Colorado. There's no lack of things to do here in this state. So we really appreciate you coming uh, and seeing us too, Matt, uh, in the, the same trip. way. Yeah, thank you. Highlight the trip. Um, you know, every now and again here on the lock-in, we sing a song or two, and sometimes our audience gets a bit rowdy and is bold. They're bold enough to ask if anybody, if our audience, if our if our guests can sing anything themselves. I mean, do you have any songs in your head? You, Andrew says we know you can make whiskey, but can they sing? <laughs> uh, we'll stick to the whiskey, unless Megan wants to just. <laughs> No, um, but I don't know. Do you want to like? You have it, girl. So, yeah. um, a couple of weeks ago, um, so I am also the president of the Colorado Distillers Guild, and um, so we were asked to do um, an Instagram live for ACSA, which is our American Craft Spirits Association um, National Guild, um, and they asked us um, if Jeff asked us if we had um, a toast. And we looked at each other, and we did not. Um, and so I spent, you know, a little Scott, <laughs> it seems it seems terrible that we yeah. don't, as an Irish American distillery, don't have a toast. Yeah. Um, so if you, I don't know, want to raise your glasses, I I wrote one. Um, ah. <laughs> so may you gather with friends over a dram of the ram. May you start a revolution with the smarts in your head. May you walk through this world with your wits and your grace. May we all see each other as equals in space. May the luck of the Irish bring prosperity our way. And may I pour you another so that maybe you'll stay. Hey. Slancha. Love it. Love it. You're more Irish than the Irish themselves now at this stage. <laughs> your toasts and your, your marketing spiel and your, your one-liners. You put the Irish to shame. <laughs> You can call me anytime. I'll write for you. Yeah. All right. We, we might have you commission a toast for the Irish whiskey <laughs> fans of America, maybe. Ah, uh, yes. Well, look, this has been an amazing evening. Uh, thank you so much for your time, for your insights, your generosity of, of, of time and, and spirit and spirits, uh, and for, for sharing uh, your uh, little dream with us. And it's no little dream. It's a big dream. And I know mm -hmm. what it takes to put things on the line. You've put things on the line and you're following a, a, a belief and a dream. And, uh, I wish you the greatest of successes. And if there's anything we can do to help that anytime, we'd love to. And I think there's an Irish Whiskey Fans of America meetup in the future when it's safe to do so. But uh, really enjoyed our chat tonight and thrilled to have you on here. Man, thank, thank you, you. So Thank much. you, Barry. It means... It was you, fun. It was fun. You can't... Th these things mean a lot to us. So we, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, and thank you to everybody out here who took their time this evening to watch and hang out with us and uh, get to know us a little bit more. I can't wait to get get known 
uh, get to know all of you rather. But thank you again, Barry. Sláinte, Megan, and Patrick. We'll see you in person at some time in the future. In the meantime, Sláinte. we'll just drink your whiskey. Sláinte. <laughs> Sláinte. Cheers. Thanks for joining us. Megan and Patrick Miller, co-founders of Talnua Distillery. What an amazing journey they've been on. And the first time we've ever featured an American distillery, we did have our Irish whiskey versus American whiskey uh, kind of a throwdown, smackdown uh, about two months ago, which was great fun uh, when we brought in Leanne Sims to teach us about bourbon and American whiskeys. But a really nice, two nice people doing really nice things uh, and I think sharing our philosophy of just making good spirits, bringing people together and having a good time, that's what it's all about. So hopefully you enjoyed that session, uh, diving into some of the technical aspects of distilling and our first distillery tour. Uh, we do have more distillery tours in mind in the future. Uh, I've got one in particular that's going to come up in November and um, that'll be happening uh, in an Irish distillery. So stay tuned for that. So where are we? Let me have a look at the questions and the comments. Well, um, it's been a busy day here at Stories and Sips, and uh, I mentioned at the start of our night tonight that we launched today the registration for our own Irish whiskey, our first ever Irish whiskey collaboration, and that was with JJ Curry, uh, the wonderful uh, company run by Louise McGuan. It's a whiskey bonding company in County Clare in the west coast of Ireland, and Louise has built a library of spirits of whiskeys from different distilleries around Ireland. And we were fortunate enough to collaborate with Louise on our very own whiskey to celebrate and to honor the growing Irish whiskey community in the United States and especially around stories and sips and the Irish whiskey fans of America. We launched our pre-registration today at three o'clock Eastern and within 90 minutes, I have the numbers here somewhere, we, within 90 minutes, we had pre-registered interest for 165 of our 200 bottles, for 357 of our 400 miniature bottles, and for 180 of our commemorative Tua glasses. To say that I'm bowled over is an understatement. I'm wowed. I'm humbled. I'm Mrs. Stories is coming over here now to give a big smile because she's proud as well. But it's a, it's a remarkable moment, not just for me, but for us, for the community, and the fact that we've got this amazing whiskey and that it has now sold out um when i joined when we joined the uh, the live stream tonight i said there was five bottles left i just checked the numbers we're now eight bottles over um subscribed but if you are interested in getting hold of a bottle of the story be it a full bottle or a miniature bottle i'd encourage you to still register uh pre-register your interest in our facebook group and our facebook group for those of you that don't know is irish whiskey fans of america we put up on the screen here and inside there, there's an announcement under the announcements tab in the group that uh, mentions our, our, our mentions the story, our whiskey, and how you can pre-register your interest. It's a very simple form. It's not binding. It's not a purchase. You just let us know of the six or seven different options we have. We've got packages of glassware and miniature bottles and full bottles, which ones you'd be interested in. And uh, if there are people who are higher up on the list than you, who for whatever reason can't purchase a bottle, we'll keep moving down the list until we have all of our bottles sold. So there's every chance that those on the waiting list will still be able to get hold of a bottle because we know that things pop up and people have to change their minds for various reasons. So uh, please uh, do go and register there. It was an amazing day. Um, I had predictions myself of um, 75, perhaps 75 orders by the end of the day. And to sit and watch that spreadsheet populate in real time and to see 165 orders come in in the first hour or hour and 75 minutes was just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, so a great day for us. I'm encouraged. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Mrs. Stories and Sips is, is jumping up and down. She's excited too. We're, this is the first collaboration. And if this collaboration is anything to go by, there'll be more. And I think we're what we're doing here now is we're, we've started on a journey and the story itself contains many chapters, but the story itself is a chapter in the ongoing story that we're going to tell about Irish whiskey, bringing people together and uh, learning as we go. I'm learning every day uh, and I'm asking those who are much smarter than me to help me understand what happens in this world of Irish whiskey. And there's many who are joining here tonight that have better palates and better understanding. And that's the beauty of this community is that there's so many interested and interesting people sharing with one another about their love for Irish whiskey. And it's an every day is a school day in our group. So thank you so much for your support. It means the world to me. And I cannot wait 
until we have this whiskey in everybody's hands and we're going to do a massive online tasting. Um, we have some, we, let's just say we have some plans for doing something very special for, for online event to launch the whiskey once it's in your hands or to, to, to officially open the bottles together. And uh, I'll be announcing that in the next few weeks. Our whiskey gets on a pallet on Wednesday and all going to plan. Tuesday, the labels arrive at the farm at JJ Kari, which means between Tuesday and Wednesday, 600 labels have to be applied, 400 miniature labels and 200 full-size labels. And then they have to make their way onto a pallet. The pallet is going to find its way to a ship and it is going to spend um, 12 days at sea to get to us in uh, on the east coast of the United States where it'll be picked up and transported to California and our retailer, uh, Folsom Wine and Spirits, will uh, then be able to take our orders. So if you're on the list, if you registered your interest today, you'll be getting an email from me in the next week or two letting you know to confirm availability of the things you selected. And then on the day when it is finally available, which I would anticipate being the end of November, early December, you'll get an email uh, asking you to make your purchase. As simple as that. And then once you have your purchase, maybe a week later, we'll do an incredible live stream event. Uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, exciting times. Exciting times. Johnny says we're doing, the God, we're doing God's work. That's an exaggeration, a big exaggeration, but we're having fun and we're drinking whiskey and isn't that all that matters? Uh, Gary says he never had a doubt. So excited. Oh, it was a great day. It was a great day. <laughs> Tony says, you and the missus have done a fantastic job with all of this. Yes, behind the Mr. Mr. Stories and Sips is a, is a much more uh, level-headed, balanced human, Mrs. Stories and Sips. And so we've heard to thank for the support and the balance and the encouragement. <laughs> um Thanks, Patrick, uh, for that. Appreciate it. And thanks, Maureen. Uh, so, yeah, it was a great day. And I think we've broken some records with selling out a JJ Curry release uh, in such time or selling out pre-interest anyway, uh, or establishing pre-interest, uh, pre-registration interest, which is great news. So everyone's a winner. Great whiskey making its way to great people from great distilleries and great whiskey companies. Nobody's losing. Nobody is losing. Wayne says he can't wait for the release. Maureen, you know, that's a great idea. I had that idea as well, and I never followed through on it. I wonder if I still have time. Wouldn't that be fun? Put a tracker on the pallets so we can follow it like NORAD Track Santa. I wonder if they'd drop a little, a little tracker in there. All right, I'll ask them. <laughs> Patrick says Homeland Security would love that. <laughs> um, yeah, for, so for everyone who registered probably before 5 o'clock Eastern today, I'm pretty sure you got your bottle. I'm pretty sure you're guaranteed to get your bottle. Uh, we're, we're oversubscribed as of about 7 o'clock Eastern, I think, or 8 o'clock Eastern, is it? Um, 8 o'clock Eastern, I think you're oversubscribed. Ed doesn't want his tracked off the grid, off the grid. Well, that's a good idea. Peter says we can track it by the ship name. All right, that's what we're going to do. If we can't put a tracker in there, we'll get the ship's name, and we'll track it on the, uh, the maritime tracking website, and, and we'll keep an eye on it. And we won't sleep till it gets safely to American shores or till it gets safely into our hands. All right. I'm going to... Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go on much longer in a live stream tonight. It's been a long day, big day. Um, again, another mention, Waterford Distillery. Get your hands on... If you haven't already ordered Waterford, there's going to be big things coming from Waterford in the future. And I'm excited to see what... what um, you think of the Waterford releases, these young releases that have had an incredible journey uh, are going to, uh, what your feedback is going to be on those. If you are interested in Waterford whiskey, check out the details of how to purchase online in our Facebook group. Um, Dermot says, it's time to get moving on the story 1.2. <laughs> yes, there have been conversations. There have been conversations. Um, yeah, we have to figure out a plan for how we make this uh, something special. I want anything we do to have some really special elements to it, something that you can't get anywhere else. Um, if this were a time when we could do things in person, believe me, it would have involved many in-person events. Uh, we can't do that, sadly, but maybe next year's release or if we do one every six months, we're still talking and thinking about what that might look like. But look, let's get over this one first, and it's still not in our hands. We have many hurdles to cross and waves to, to traverse before we can celebrate too much. Uh, James says he's gutted no water for shipping to Massachusetts. Um, well, James, this is the first, what you're looking at is the online only 
uh, the online only release. So I am pretty sure that Waterford will be in Massachusetts, but it'll be on shelves in sh in stores. So don't be discouraged if you can't find them shipping. There's often reasons why shipping isn't possible to all states. In our case, it's because the states don't allow shipping in with the story. So for three states, Ohio, Alabama, and Utah, we just can't ship. In other cases, it's because of distributor relationships. So there may be distributor relationships that prevent separate selling of Waterford Distillery in that state online, of that whiskey online. And so the distributor in the state may have a um, may have first preference or, or, or priority on selling. So just stay tuned. Um, and we, I'll find out for you on Massachusetts, and I'll, I'll put that in the Facebook group for you. Stacy says that the story 1.2 should only be available in Ohio. You know, of course, that's out of our hands, sadly, because of Ohio's reluctance to open up the list uh, too widely. Uh, and I will say, I was, I was having a conversation with uh, somebody from the Irish whiskey industry today, and they have said that they are trying to make inroads into Ohio, and they are making good progress in opening up the doors in Ohio to even more whiskey. So stay tuned on that. Hopefully, we'll hear more things on that uh, very, very soon. All right. So we're almost through here tonight. It was a great night. Um, I'm mature and wise enough to know now that I don't get off scot-free at the end of the night because I see 30 comments saying the night doesn't end without an old song. And so we'd have to have an old song to celebrate the, the day that we had. But first, I'm going to pour another drop of red breast. And after I drink my red breast, I'm going to retire and make myself a... Um, I need another glass there somewhere. I'm going to... Um, Make myself a Talnua quarter cask old-fashioned. It won't be a quarter as good, see what I did there, as what I can get in the distillery, but I'll still be making one. I don't know, do we have any orange? No orange. It's already, it's already lost to us. No worries. No orange slices. What kind of hotel is this? Oh, do we? Very good. Hey! Mrs. Stories and Sips, frozen orange pieces. Look, she thinks of everything. She's, she has bags in the freezer of little, she, to avoid waste, instead of throwing something away at the end, she'll cut a piece up and she'll put it in the freezer and then defrost it later. Look at that. The brains behind the operation. All right. Have a drop of, uh... cheers, Kieran. Glad to see you joining us. Were you, were you joining us on the baseball practice again tonight? No? <laughs> Oil up the pipes. Oil up the pipes. Cheers, Peter. Thanks for the support. Um, thank you all for the support, as always. Uh, really enjoying every week we hang out here. Our whiskey world, is the Irish whiskey community is getting stronger and stronger, and we're getting more and more complex with all the things we're trying to do. But we've got some great ideas coming down the pipe in the next six months, let me tell you. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing with them, them with you as well. Everybody is celebrating Mrs. Stories and Sips. She's the best. She is. She treats you better than you deserve, boy. She does. Andrew obviously knows me. <laughs> She's way ahead of you, Barry. She is. Look at that. We'd be lost without her. Julie says, thanks for having Patrick and Megan on tonight. It was awesome. It was. It was a great chat. Uh, and we'll do it again. We'll do it again. And Mark says, we've reached a wider audience with this live stream. Maybe we have. Maybe we have. All right. I'm going to sip this pot still. Red breast. Kieran knows knows me too well. It's as far from frozen orange as you were reared. <laughs> I don't think I saw an orange till I was 20. <laughs> I don't think I saw shoes till I was 16. All right, so what are we? We're singing the old triangle. That's that's the uh, in Ireland growing up at the end of the night in the pub, they turn the lights on or in a club and they play the national anthem and everybody would stand up and sing the national anthem. That was the uh, the sign to go home. You couldn't sit down after that. You have to grab your coat and go home. Our version, our own national anthem for our little uh, dominion, our community is the Owl Triangle, whether we like it or not. <laughs> All right, Tony with some interesting cocktail suggestions there. Redbreast 12 goes with a cherry sundae and later Tootsie Rolls. Tony, anything you can do to get it into you? I don't think Redbreast will complain. All right. Uh, so... For the first time on our new camera equipment and new lighting, the Owl Triangle. <clears throat> Let's roll. A hungry feeling came o'er me stealing 
And the mice were squealing in my prison cell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. To begin the morning, the screw was bawling. Get up, you bowsy, and clean out your cell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. Up in the female prison, there are 75 women. And amongst those women, I wish I did dwell. And the old triangle went jingle, bloody jangle. All along the banks of the Royal Canal. And the old triangle went jingle jangle. All along the banks of the Royal Canal. All along the banks of the Royal Canal. You Let's launch everybody a great night. Thanks to Megan and Patrick for entertaining us and sharing their distillery and their dream with us. Thanks to you for your support for the story. Tell your friends about what we do here. They might like it. And we'd love to grow our community. So share it far and wide. I love hanging out with you. It's the highlight of my week. The entire week builds up to this. So I look forward to seeing you back here next week. And look forward to seeing you in the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group in the meantime. So, slaunch everybody. Thanks for the support. Thanks for everything you're doing for Irish Whiskey as well. By consuming it and ordering it, um, you're making the Irish very happy. Slaunch you. Until next week.